Section 1 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Alex Lau. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Old House. A very old house stood once in a street, with several that were quite new and clean. The date of its erection had been carved on one of the beams, and surrounded by scrolls formed of tulips and hop tendrils. By this date it could be seen that the old house was nearly three hundred years old. Verses, too, were written over the windows, in old-fashioned letters, and grotesque faces, curiously carved, grinned at you from under the cornices. One story projected a long way over the other, and under the roof ran a leaden gutter with a dragon's head at the end. The rain was intended to pour out at the dragon's mouth, but it ran out of his body instead, for there was a hole in the gutter. The other houses in the street were new and well built, with large window panes and smooth walls. Anyone could see they had nothing to do with the old house. Perhaps, they thought, how long will that heap of rubbish remain here to be a disgrace to the whole street? The parapet projects so far forward that no one can see out of our windows. What is going on in that direction? The stairs are as broad as the staircase of a castle, and as steep as if they led to a church tower. The iron railings look like the gate of a cemetery, and there are brass knobs upon it. It is really too ridiculous. Opposite to the old house were more nice new homes, which had just the same opinion as their neighbours. At the window of one of them sat a little boy with fresh rosy cheeks and clear sparkling eyes, who was very fond of the old house, in sunshine or in moonlight. He would sit and look at the wall from which the plaster had in some places fallen off, and fancy all sorts of scenes which had been in former times. How the street must have looked when the houses had all gable roofs, open staircases, and gutters with dragons at the spout. He could even see soldiers walking about with halberds. Certainly it was a very good house to look at for amusement. An old man lived in it, who wore knee breeches, a coat with large brass buttons, and a wig which anyone could see was a real wig. Every morning an old man came to clean the rooms, and to wait upon him. Otherwise the old man in the knee breeches would have been quite alone in the house. Sometimes he came to one of the windows and looked out. Then the little boy nodded to him, and the old man nodded back again till they became acquainted and were friends, although they had never spoken to each other, but that was of no consequence. The little boy one day heard his parents say, The old man opposite is very well off, but is terribly lonely. The next Sunday morning the little boy wrapped something in a piece of paper and took it to the door of the old house, and said to the attendant who waited upon the old man, Will you please give this from me to the gentleman who lives here? I have two tin soldiers, and this is one of them, and he shall have it because I know he is terribly lonely. And the old attendant nodded and looked very pleased and then he carried a tin soldier into the house. Afterwards he was sent over to ask the little boy if he would not like to pay a visit himself. His parents gave him permission, and so it was that he gained admission to the old house. The brassy knobs on the railings shone more brightly than ever, as if they had been polished on account of his visit, and on the door were carved trumpeters standing in tulips, and it seemed as if they were blowing with all their might their cheeks were so puffed out. Tantarara, the little boy is coming. Tantarara, the little boy is coming. Then the door opened. All round the hall hung old portraits of knights in armour, and ladies in silk gowns. And the armour rattled, and the silk dresses rustled. Then came a staircase which went up a long way, and then came down a little way, and led to a balcony, which was in a very ruinous state. There were large holes and long cracks, 
out of which grew grass and leaves. Indeed, the whole balcony, the courtyard, and the walls were so overgrown with green that they looked like a garden. In the balcony stood flower-pots, on which were heads having asses' ears, but the flowers in them grew just as they pleased. In one pot pinks were growing all over the sides. At least the green leaves were shooting forth stalk and stem, and saying as plainly as they could speak, The air has fanned me, the sun has kissed me, and I am promised a little flower for next Sunday, really, for next Sunday. Then they entered a room in which the walls were covered with leather, and the leather had golden flowers stamped upon it. Gilding will fade in damp weather, to endure there is nothing like leather, said the walls. Chairs handsomely carved with elbows on each side, and with very high backs stood in the room, and as they creaked they seemed to say, Sit down, oh dear, how I am creaking! I shall certainly have the gout like the old cupboard. Gout in my back! Ugh! And then the little boy entered the room where the old man sat. Thank you for the tin soldier, my little friend, said the old man, and thank you also for coming to see me. Thanks, thanks, or creak, creak, said all the furniture. There was so much that the pieces of furniture stood in each of his way to get a sight of the little boy. On the wall near the centre of the room hung the picture of a beautiful lady, young and gay, dressed in the fashion of the olden times, with powdered hair and a full stiff skirt. She said neither thanks nor creak, but she looked down upon the little boy with her mild eyes, and then he said to the old man, Where did you get that picture? From the shop opposite, he replied. Many portraits hang there that none seem to trouble themselves about. The persons they represent have been dead and buried long since. But I knew this lady many years ago, and she has been dead nearly half a century. Under a glass beneath the picture hung a nosegay of withered flowers, which were no doubt half a century old too, at least they appeared so, and the pendulum of the old clock went to and fro, and the hands turned round, and as time passed on, everything in the room grew older, but no one seemed to notice it. They say at home, said the little boy, that you are very lonely. Oh, replied the old man, I have pleasant thoughts of all that has passed, recalled by memory, and now you are come to visit me, and that is very pleasant. Then he took from the bookcase a book full of pictures, representing long processions of wonderful coaches, such as are never seen at the present time. Soldiers like the knave of clubs, and citizens with waving banners. The tailors had a flag with a pair of scissors, supported by two lions, and on the shoemaker's flag there were not boots, but an eagle with two heads. For the shoemakers must have everything arranged, so that they can say, This is a pair! What a picture-book it was! And then the old man went into another room to fetch apples and nuts. It was very pleasant, certainly, to be in that old house. I cannot endure it, said the tin soldier, who stood on a shelf. It is so lonely and dull here. I have been accustomed to live in a family, and I cannot get used to this life. I cannot bear it. The whole day is long enough, but the evening is longer. It is not here like it was in your house opposite. When your father and mother talked so cheerfully together, while you and all the dear children made such a delightful noise. No, it is lonely in the old man's house. Do you think he gets any kisses? Do you think he ever has friendly looks, or a Christmas tree? You will have nothing now but the grave. Oh, I cannot bear it! You must not look only on the sorrowful side, said the little boy. I think everything in this house is beautiful, and all the old pleasant thoughts come back here to pay visits. Ah, but I never see any, and I don't know them, said the tin soldier, and I cannot bear it. You must bear it, said the little boy. Then the old man came back with a pleasant face, and brought with him beautiful preserved fruits as well as apples and nuts. 
and the little boy thought no more of the tin soldier. How happy and delighted the little boy was! And after he returned home, and while days and weeks passed, a great deal of nodding took place from one house to the other. And then the little boy went to pay another visit. The carved trumpeters blew, Tantara ra there is the little boy, Tantara ra The swords and armour on the old knight's pictures rattled, the silk dresses rustled, the leather repeated its rhyme, and the old chairs had their gout in their backs, and cried, Creak! It was all exactly like the first time, for in that house one day and one hour were just like another. I cannot bear it any longer, said the tin soldier. I have wept tears of tin. It is so melancholy here. Let me go to the wars and lose an arm or a leg. That would be some change. I cannot bear it. I was nearly jumping from the shelf. I saw you all in your house opposite, as if you were really present. It was Sunday morning, and you children stood round the table, singing the hymn that you sing every morning. You were standing quietly, with your hands folded, and your father and mother were looking just as serious, when the door opened, and your little sister Maria, who is not two years old, was brought into the room. You know she always dances when she hears music and singing of any sort. So she began to dance immediately, although she ought not to have done so, but she could not get into the right time, because the tune was so slow. So she stood first on one leg, and then on the other, and bent her head very low. But it would not suit the music. You all stood looking very grave, although it was very difficult to do so. But I laughed so to myself that I fell down from the table and got a bruise, which is there still. I know it was not right to laugh. So all this and everything else that I have seen keeps running in my head. And these must be the old recollections that bring so many thoughts with them. Tell me whether you still sing on Sundays, and tell me about your little sister, Maria, and how my old comrade is, the other tin soldier. Ah, really he must be very happy. I cannot endure this life. You are given away, said the little boy. You must stay, don't you see that? Then the old man came in with a box containing many curious things to show him. Rouge pots, scent boxes and old cards, so large and so richly gilded, that none are ever seen like them in these days. And there were smaller boxes to look at, and a piano was opened, and inside the lid were painted landscapes. But when the old man played, the piano sounded quite out of tune. Then he looked at a picture he had bought at the broker's, and his eyes sparkled brightly as he nodded at it, and said, Ah, she could sing that tune. I will go to the wars, I will go to the wars, cried the tin soldier, as loud as he could, and threw himself down on the floor. Where could he have fallen? The old man searched, and the little boy searched, but he was gone, and could not be found. I shall find him again said the old man, but he did not find him. The boards of the floor were open and full of holes. The tin soldier had fallen through a crack between the boards, and lay there now in an open grave. The day went by, and the little boy returned home. The week passed, and many more weeks. It was winter, and the windows were quite frozen. So the little boy was obliged to breathe on the panes and rub a hole to peep through at the old house. Snowdrifts were lying in all the scrolls and on the inscriptions, and the steps were covered with snow, as if no one were at home. And indeed, nobody was home, for the old man was dead. In the evening, a hearse stopped at the door, and the old man in his coffin was placed in it. He was to be taken to the country to be buried there in his own grave so they carried him away. No one followed him, for all his friends were dead. And the little boy kissed his hand to the coffin as the hearse moved away with it. A few days after, there was an auction at the old house, and from his window the little boy saw the people 
carrying away the pictures of old knights and ladies. The flower-pots with the long ears, the old chairs, and the cupboards. Some were taken one way, some another. Her portrait, which had been bought at the picture-dealer's, went back again to his shop, and there it remained, for no one seemed to know her, or to care for the old picture. In the spring they began to pull the house itself down. People called it complete rubbish. From the street could be seen the room in which the walls were covered with leather, ragged and torn, and a green in the balcony, bung straggling over the beams. They pulled it down quickly, for it looked ready to fall, and at last it was cleared away altogether. "'What a good riddance!' said the neighbours' houses. Very shortly a fine new house was built farther back from the road. It had lofty windows and smooth walls, but in front, on the spot where the old house really stood, a little garden was planted, and wild vines grew up over the neighbouring walls. In front of the garden were large iron railings and a great gate, which looked very stately. People used to stop and peep through the railings. The sparrows assembled in dozens upon the wild vines, and chattered all together as loud as they could. But not about the old house. None of them could remember it, for many years had passed by, so many, indeed, that the little boy was now a man, and a really good man, too, and his parents were very proud of him. He was just married, and had come with his young wife to reside in the new house, with the garden in front of it. And now he stood there by her side, while she planted a field flower that she thought very pretty. She was planting it herself with her little hands, and pressing down the earth with her fingers. Oh dear, what was that? she exclaimed, as something pricked her. Out of the soft earth something was sticking up. It was, only think, it was really the tin soldier, the very same which had been lost up in the old man's room and had been hidden among old wood and rubbish for a long time, till it sunk into the earth, where it must have been for many years. And a young wife wiped the soldier, first with a green leaf, and then with her fine pocket handkerchief, that smelt of such beautiful perfume, and the tin soldier felt as if he was recovering from a fainting fit. "'Let me see him,' said the young man, and then he smiled and shook his head, and said, It can scarcely be the same, but it reminds me of something that happened to one of my tin soldiers when I was a little boy. And then he told his wife about the old house, and the old man, and of the tin soldier which he had sent across, because he thought the old man was lonely. And he related the story so clearly, that tears came into the eyes of the young wife, for the old house and the old man. It is very likely that this is really the same soldier, said she, and I will take care of him, and always remember what you have told me, but some day you must show me the old man's grave. I don't know where it is, he replied. No one knows. All his friends are dead. No one took care of him, and I was only a little boy. Oh, how dreadfully lonely he must have been, said she. Yes, terribly lonely, cried the tin soldier. Still, it is delightful not to be forgotten. Delightful indeed, cried a voice quite near to them. No one but the tin soldier saw that it came from a rag of the leather which hung in tatters. It had lost all its gilding, and looked like wet earth, but it had an opinion, and it spoke thus. Gilding will fade in damp weather, to endure... There is nothing like leather. But the tin soldier did not believe any such thing. End of the Old House Reading by Alex Lau www.twitter.com slash alex of the day Section 2 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Kerry Norman. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Drop of Water. Of course, you know what is meant by a magnifying glass. One of those round spectacle glasses that make everything look a hundred times bigger than it is? When anyone takes one of these and holds it up to his eye and looks at a drop of water from the pond yonder, he sees above a thousand wonderful creatures that are otherwise never discerned in the water. But there they are, and it is no delusion. It almost looks like a great plate full of spiders jumping about in a crowd. And how fierce they are! They tear off each other's legs and arms and bodies, before and behind, and yet they are merry and joyful, in their way. Now there once was an old man whom all the people called Cribble Crabble, for that was his name. He always wanted the best of everything, and when he could not manage it otherwise, he did it by magic. There he sat one day and held his magnifying glass to his eye, and looked at a drop of water that had been taken out of a puddle by the ditch. But what a cribbling and crabbling was there! All the thousands of little creatures hopped and sprang and tugged at one another and ate each other up. That is horrible, said old Cribble Crabble. Can one not persuade them to live in peace and quietness, so that each one may mind his own business? And he thought it over and over, but it would not do, so he had to recourse to magic. I must give them colour, that they may be seen more clearly, said he, and poured something like a little drop of red wine into the drop of water. But it was witch's blood, from the lobes of the ear, the finest kind at ninepence a drop. And now the wonderful little creatures were pink all over. It looked like a whole town of naked wild men. What have you there? asked another old magician, who had no name, and that was the best thing about him. Yes, if you couldn't guess what it is, said Cribble Crabble, I'll make you a present of it. But it is not so easy to find out if one does not know. And the magician, who had no name, looked through the magnifying glass. It looked like a really great town reflected there, in which all the people were running about without clothes. It was terrible, but it was still more terrible to see how one beat and pushed the other, and bit and hacked and tugged and mauled him. Those at the top were being pulled down, and those at the bottom were struggling upwards. Look, look, his leg is longer than mine. Bah, away with it. There is one who has a little bruise. It hurts him, but it shall hurt him more and they hacked away at him, and they pulled at him, and ate him up because of the little bruise. And there was one sitting as still as any little maiden, and wishing only for peace and quietness. But now she had to come out, and they tugged at her, and pulled her about, and ate her up. That's funny, said the magician. Yes, but what do you think it is? said Cribble Crabble. Can you find that out? Why, one can see that easily enough, said the other. That's Paris or some other great city, for they are all alike. It is a great city. It is a drop of puddle water, said Cribble Crabble. End of the Drop of Water Recording by Kerry Norman Section 3 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848-1853, to by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. Section 3. The Happy Family. The largest green leaf in this country is certainly the burdock leaf. If you hold it in front of you, it is large enough for an apron, and if you hold it over your head, it is almost as good as an umbrella. It is so wonderfully large. A burdock never grows alone. Where it grows, there are many more, and it is a splendid sight, and all this splendor is good for snails. The great white snails, which grand people in olden times used to have made into fricassees, and when they had eaten them, they would say, oh what a delicious dish for these people really thought them good and these snails lived on burdock leaves and for them the burdock was planted there was once an old estate where no one now lived to require snails indeed the owners had all died out but the burdock still flourished 
it grew over all the beds and walks of the garden till it became at last quite a forest of burdocks here and there stood an apple or a plum tree but for this nobody would have thought the place had ever been a garden it was burdock from one end to the other and here lived the last two surviving snails they knew not themselves how old they were but they could remember the time when there were a great many more of them and that they were descended from a family which came from foreign lands and that the whole forest had been planted for them and theirs they had never been away from the garden but they knew that another place once existed in the world called the duke's palace castle in which some of their relations had been boiled till they became black and were then laid on a silver dish but what was done afterwards they did not know besides they could not imagine exactly how it felt to be boiled and placed on a silver dish but no doubt it was something very fine and highly genteel neither the cockchafer nor the toad nor the earthworm whom they questioned about it would give them the least information for none of their relations had ever been cooked or served on a silver dish the old white snails were the most aristocratic race in the world they knew that the forest had been planted for them and the nobleman's castle had been built entirely that they might be cooked and laid on silver dishes they lived quite retired and very happily and as they had no children of their own they had adopted a little common snail which they brought up as their own child the little one would not grow for he was only a common snail but the old people particularly the mother snail declared that she could easily see how he grew and when the father said he could not perceive it she begged him to feel the little snail's shell and he did so and found that the mother was right one day it rained very fast listen what a drumming there is on the burdock leaves turn 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 said the father snail there come the drops said the mother they are trickling down the stalks we shall have it very wet here presently i am very glad we have such good houses and that the little one has one of his own there has been really more done for us than for any other creature it is quite plain that we are the most noble people in the world we have houses from our birth and the burdock forest has been planted for us i should very much like to know how far it extends and what lies beyond it there can be nothing better than we have here said the father snail i wish for nothing more yes but i do said the mother i should like to be taken to the palace and boiled and laid upon a silver dish as was done for all our ancestors and you may be sure it must be something very uncommon the nobleman's castle perhaps has fallen to decay said the snail father or the burdock wood may have grown out you need not be in a hurry you are always so impatient and the youngster is getting just the same he has been three days creeping to the top of that stalk i feel quite giddy when i look at him you must not scold him said the mother snail he creeps so very carefully he will be the joy of our home and we old folks have nothing else to live for but have you ever thought where we are to get a wife for him do you think that farther out in the woods there may be others of our race there may be black snails no doubt said the old snail black snails without houses but they are so vulgar and conceited too but we can give the ants a commission they run here and there as if they all had so much business to get through they most likely will know of a wife for our youngster i certainly know a most beautiful bride said one of the ants but i fear it would not do for she is a queen that doesn't matter said the old snail has she a house she has a palace replied the ant a most beautiful ant palace with seven hundred passages thank you said the mother snail but our boy shall not go to live in an ant hill if you know of nothing better we will give the commission to the white gnats they fly about in rain and sunshine they know the burdock wood from one end to the other we have a wife for him said the gnats a hundred man steps from here there is a little snail with a house sitting on a gooseberry bush she is quite alone and old enough to be married it is only a hundred man steps from here 
then let her come to him said the old people he has the whole burdock forest she has only a bush so they brought the little lady snail she took eight days to perform the journey but that was just as it ought to be for it showed her to be one of the right breeding and then they had a wedding six glowworms gave as much light as they could but in other respects it was all very quiet for the old snails could not bear festivities or a crowd but a beautiful speech was made by the mother snail the father could not speak he was much too overcome then they gave the whole burdock forest to the young snails as an inheritance and repeated what they had so often said that it was the finest place in the world and that if they led upright and honorable lives and their family increased they and their children might some day be taken to the nobleman's palace to be boiled black and laid on a silver dish and when they had finished speaking the old couple crept into their houses and came out no more for they slept the young snail pair now ruled in the forest and had a numerous progeny but as the young ones were never boiled or laid in silver dishes they concluded that the castle had fallen into decay and that all the people in the world were dead and as nobody contradicted them they thought they must be right and the rain fell upon the burdock leaves to play the drum for them and the sun shone to paint colors on the burdock forest for them and they were very happy the whole family were entirely and perfectly happy End of section three recording by Linda Fredericks, Modesto, California, August two thousand twelve. Section four of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume three eighteen forty eight to eighteen fifty three by hans christian andersen translated by h p paul section four the story of a mother a mother sat by her little child she was very sad for she feared it would die it was quite pale and its little eyes were closed and sometimes it drew a heavy breath almost like a sigh and then the mother gazed more sadly than ever on the poor little creature some one knocked at the door and a poor old man walked in he was wrapped in something that looked like a great horse-cloth and he required it truly to keep him warm for it was cold winter the country everywhere lay covered with snow and ice and the wind blew so sharply that it cut one's face the little child had dozed off to sleep for a moment and the mother seeing that the old man shivered with the cold rose and placed a mug of beer on the stove to warm for him the old man sat and rocked the cradle and the mother seated herself on a chair near him and looked at her sick child who still breathed heavily and took hold of its little hand you think i shall keep him do you not she said our all-merciful god will surely not take him away from me the old man who was indeed death himself nodded his head in a peculiar manner which might have signified either yes or no and the mother cast down her eyes while the tears rolled down her cheeks then her head became heavy for she had not closed her eyes for three days and nights and she slept but only for a moment shivering with cold she started up and looked round the room the old man was gone and her child it was gone too the old man had taken it with him in the corner of the room the old clock began to strike whirr went the chains the heavy weight sank to the ground and the clock stopped and the poor mother rushed out of the house calling for her child out in the snow sat a woman in long black garments and she said to the mother death has been in your room i saw him hastening away with your little child he strides faster than the wind and never brings back what he has taken away only tell me which way he has gone said the mother tell me the way i will find him i know the way said the woman in the black garments but before i tell you you must sing to me all the songs that you have sung to your child i love these songs i have heard them before i am night and i saw your tears flow as you sang i will sing them all to you said the mother 
but do not detain me now i must overtake him and find my child but the knight sat silent and still then the mother wept and sang and wrung her hands and there were many songs and yet even more tears till at length night said go to the right into the dark forest of fir trees for i saw death take that road with your little child within the wood the mother came to crossroads and she knew not which to take just by stood a thorn bush it had neither leaf nor flower for it was the cold winter time and icicles hung on the branches have you not seen death go by with my little child she asked yes replied the thorn bush but i will not tell you which way he has taken until you have warmed me in your bosom i am freezing to death here and turning to ice then she pressed the bramble to her bosom quite close so that it might be thawed and the thorns pierced her flesh and great drops of blood flowed but the bramble shot forth fresh green leaves and they became flowers on the cold winter's night so warm is the heart of a sorrowing mother then the bramble bush told her the path she must take she came at length to a great lake on which there was neither ship nor boat to be seen the lake was not frozen sufficiently for her to pass over the ice nor was it open enough for her to wade through and yet she must cross it if she wished to find her child then she laid herself down to drink up the water of the lake which was of course impossible for any human being to do but the bereaved mother thought that perhaps a miracle might take place to help her you will never succeed in this said the lake let us make an agreement together which will be better i love to collect pearls and your eyes are the purest i have ever seen if you will weep those eyes away in tears into my waters then i will take you to the large hothouse where death dwells and rears flowers and trees every one of which is a human life oh what i would not give to reach my child said the weeping mother and as she still continued to weep her eyes fell into the depths of the lake and became two costly pearls then the lake lifted her up and wafted her across to the opposite shore as if she were on a swing where stood a wonderful building with many miles in length no one could tell whether it was a mountain covered with forests and full of caves or whether it had been built but the poor mother could not see for she had wept her eyes into the lake where shall i find death who went away with my little child she asked he has not arrived here yet said an old gray-haired woman who was walking about and watering death's hothouse how have you found your way here and who helped you god has helped me she replied he is merciful will you not be merciful too where shall i find my little child i did not know the child said the old woman and you are blind many flowers and trees have faded to-night and death will soon come to transplant them you know already that every human being has a life tree or a life flower just as may be ordained for him they look like other plants but they have hearts that beat children's hearts also beat from that you may perhaps be able to recognize your child but what will you give me if i tell you what more you will have to do i have nothing to give said the afflicted mother but i would go to the ends of the earth for you i can give you nothing to do for me there said the old woman but you can give me your long black hair you know yourself that it is beautiful and it pleases me you can take my white hair in exchange which will be something in return do you ask nothing more than that she said i will give it to you with pleasure and she gave up her beautiful hair and received in return the white locks of the old woman then they both went into death's vast hothouse where flowers and trees grew together in wonderful profusion blooming hyacinths under glass bells and peonies like strong trees there grew water plants some quite fresh and others looking sickly which had water snakes twining round them and black crabs clinging to their stems there stood noble palm trees oaks and plantains and beneath them bloomed thyme and parsley each tree and flower had a name 
each represented a human life and belonged to men still living some in china others in greenland and in all parts of the world some large trees had been planted in little pots so that they were cramped for room and seemed about to burst the pot to pieces while many weak little flowers were growing in rich soil with moss all around them carefully tended and cared for the sorrowing mother bent over the little plants and heard the human heart beating in each and recognized the beatings of her child's heart among millions of others that is it she cried stretching out her hand towards a little crocus flower which hung down its sickly head do not touch the flower exclaimed the old woman but place yourself here and when death comes i expect him every minute do not let him pull up that plant but threaten him that if he does you will serve the other flowers in the same manner this will make him afraid for he must account to god for each of them none can be uprooted unless he receives permission to do so there rushed through the hothouse a chill of icy coldness and the blind mother felt that death had arrived how did you find your way hither he asked how could you come here faster than i have i am a mother she answered and death stretched out his hand towards the delicate little flower but she held her hands tightly round it and held it fast at the same time with the most anxious care lest she should touch one of the leaves then death breathed upon her hands and she felt his breath colder than the icy wind and her hands sank down powerless you cannot prevail against me said death but a god of mercy can she said i only do his will replied death i am his gardener i take all his flowers and trees and transplant them into the gardens of paradise in an unknown land how they flourish there and what that garden resembles i may not tell you give me back my child said the mother weeping and imploring and she seized two beautiful flowers in her hands and cried to death i will tear up all your flowers for i am in despair do not touch them said death you say you are unhappy and would you make another mother as unhappy as yourself another mother cried the poor woman setting the flowers free from her hands there are your eyes said death i fished them up out of the lake for you they were shining brightly but i knew not they were yours take them back they are clearer now than before and then look deep into the deep well which is close by here i will tell you the names of the two flowers which you wish to pull up and you will see the whole future of the human beings they represent and what you were about to frustrate and destroy then she looked into the well and it was a glorious sight to behold how one of them became a blessing to the world and how much happiness and joy it spread around but she saw that the life of the other was full of care and poverty misery and woe both are the will of god said death which is the unhappy flower and which is the blessed one she said that i may not tell you said death but thus far you may learn that one of the two flowers represents your own child it was the fate of your child that you saw the future of your own child then the mother screamed aloud with terror which of them belongs to my child tell me that deliver the unhappy child release it from so much misery rather take it away take it to the kingdom of god forget my tears and my entreaties forget all that i have said or done i do not understand you said death will you have your child back or shall i carry him away to a place that you do not know then the mother wrung her hands fell on her knees and prayed to god grant not my prayers when they are contrary to thy will which at all times must be the best oh hear them not and her head sank on her bosom then death carried away her child to the unknown land end of section four Recording by Linda Fredericks, Modesto, California, August 2012. Section 5 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Stellick, Dallas, Texas. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848. To 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul, the shirt collar. There once was a fine gentleman who possessed, among other things, a bootjack and a hairbrush, but he had also the finest shirt collar in the world, and of this collar we are about to hear a story. The collar had become so old that he began to think about getting married, and one day he happened to find himself in the same washing tub as a garter. Upon my word, said the shirt collar, I have never seen anything so slim and delicate, so neat and soft before. May I venture to ask your name? I shall not tell you, replied the garter. Where do you reside when you are at home? asked the shirt collar but the garter was naturally shy and did not know how to answer such a question i presume you are a girdle said the shirt collar a sort of under girdle i see that you are useful as well as ornamental my little lady you must not speak to me said the garter i do not think i have given you any encouragement to do so oh when anyone is as beautiful as you are said the shirt collar is not that encouragement enough get away don't come so near to me said the garter you appear to me quite like a man i am fine gentleman certainly said the shirt collar i possess a bootjack and a hairbrush this was not true for these things belonged to his master but he was a boaster don't come so near to me said the garter i am not accustomed to it affection said the shirt collar then they were taken out of the wash tub starched and hung over a chair in the sunshine and then laid in the ironing board and now came the glowing iron mistress widow said the shirt collar little mistress widow i feel quite warm i am changing i am losing all my creases you are burning a hole in me ah i propose to you you old rag said the flat iron driving proudly over the collar for she fancied herself a steam engine which rolls over the railway and draws carriages you old rag said she the edges of the shirt collar were a little frayed so the scissors were brought to cut them smooth oh exclaimed the shirt collar what a first-rate dancer you would make you could stretch out your legs so well i never saw anything so charming i am sure no human being could do the same i should think not replied the scissors you ought to be a countess said the shirt collar but all i possess consists of a fine gentleman a bootjack and a comb i wish i had an estate for your sake what is he going to propose to me said the scissors and she became so angry that she cut too sharply into the shirt collar and it was obliged to be thrown by as useless i shall be obliged to propose to the hairbrush thought the shirt collar so he remarked one day it is wonderful what beautiful hair you have my little lady have you never thought of being engaged you might know i should think of it answered the hairbrush i am engaged to the bootjack engaged cried the shirt collar now there is no one left to propose to and then he pretended to despise all love-making a long time passed and the shirt collar was taken in a bag to the paper mill he was a large company of rags the fine ones lying by themselves separated from the coarser as it ought to be they had all many things to relate especially the shirt collar who was a terrible boaster i have had an immense number of love affairs said the shirt collar no one left me any peace it is true i was a very fine gentleman quite stuck up i had a bootjack and a brush that i never used 
You should have seen me then when I was turned down. I shall never forget my first love. She was a girdle, so charming and fine and soft, and she threw herself into a washing tub for my sake. There was a widow, too, who was warmly in love with me, but I left her alone, and she became quite black. The next was a first-rate dancer. She gave me the wound from which I still suffer. She was so passionate. Even my own hairbrush was in love with me and lost all her hair through neglected love. Yes, I have had great experience of this kind, but my greatest grief was for the garter, the girdle, I meant to say, that jumped into the wash tub. I have a great deal on my conscience and it is really time I should be turned into white paper. And the shirt collar came to this at last. All the rags were made into white paper, and the shirt collar became the very identical piece of paper which we now see and on which this story is printed. It happened as a punishment to him for having boasted so shockingly of things which were not true. And this is a warning to us to be careful how we act for we may some day find ourselves in the rag bag to be turned into white paper on which our whole history may be written, even its most secret actions, and it would not be pleasant to have to run about the world in the form of a piece of paper, telling everything we have done, like the boasting shirt collar. End of The Shirt Collar Recording by Candace Stellick, Dallas, Texas Section 6 of Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Gubitz. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Flax. The flax was in full bloom. It had pretty little blue flowers, as delicate as the wings of a moth, or even more so. The sun shone, and the showers watered it, and this was just as good for the flax as it is for little children to be washed and then kissed by their mother. They look much prettier for it, and so did the flax. "'People say that I look exceedingly well,' said the flax, "'and that I am so fine and long that I shall make a beautiful piece of linen. How fortunate I am! It makes me so happy. It is such a pleasant thing to know that something can be made of me, how the sunshine cheers me, and how sweet and refreshing is the rain. My happiness overpowers me. No one in the world can feel happier than I am. Ah, yes, no doubt, said the fern but you do not know the world yet as well as i do for my sticks are naughty and then it sung quite mournfully snip snap snow vast sailor the song is ended no it's not ended said the flax to-morrow the sun will shine or the rain descend i feel that i am growing i feel that i am full blossom I. I am the happiest of all creatures. Well, one day, some people came who took hold of the flax and pulled it up by the roots. This was painful. Then it was laid in water as if they intended to drown it, and after that placed near a fire as if it were to be roasted. All this was very shocking. We cannot expect to be happy always, said the flax, by experiencing evil as well as good we become wise. And certainly there was plenty of evil in store for the flax. It was steeped and roasted and broken and combed. Indeed, it scarcely knew what was done to it. At last it was put on the spinning wheel. Whirr, whirr, went the wheel so quickly that the flax could not collect its thoughts. Well, I have been happy, he thought in the midst of his pain. I must be content with the past and contented he remained till he was put on the loom and became a beautiful piece of white linen all the flax even to the last stalk was used in making this one piece well this is quite wonderful 
I could not have believed that I should be so favoured by fortune. The fern was not wrong with the song of snip, snap, snur, bass, say, le. But the song is not ended yet, I am sure. It is only just the beginning. How wonderful it is, that after all I have suffered, I am made something of at last. I am the luckiest person in the world. So strong and fine, and how white, and what a length. This is something different to being a mere plant and bearing flowers. Then I had no attention, nor any water unless it rained. Now I am watched and taken care of. Every morning the maid turns me over, and I have a shower-bath from the watering-pot every evening. Yes, and the clergyman's wife noticed me, and said I was the best piece of linen in the whole parish. I cannot be happier than I am now. After some time... The linen was taken into the house, placed under the scissors, and cut and torn into pieces, then pricked with needles. This certainly was not pleasant, but at last it was made into twelve garments of that kind which people do not like to name, and yet everybody should wear one. "'See now, then,' said the flex, "'I have become something of importance. This was my destiny. It is quite a blessing. Now I shall be of some use in the world.' as every one ought to be. It is the only way to be happy. I am now divided into twelve pieces, and yet we are all one and the same on the whole dozen. It is most extraordinary good fortune. Years passed away, and at last the linen was so worn it could scarcely hold together. It must end very soon, said the pieces to each other. We would gladly have held together a little longer, but it is useless to expect impossibilities." and at length they fell into rags and tatters and thought it was all over for them for they were torn to shreds and steeped in water and made into a pulp and dried and they knew not what besides till all at once they found themselves beautiful white paper well now this is a surprise a glorious surprise too said the paper i am now finer than ever and i shall be written upon and who can tell what fine things i may have written upon me it is wonderful luck and sure enough the most beautiful stories and poetry were written upon it, and only once was there a blot, which was very fortunate. Then people heard the stories and poetry read, and it made them wiser and better, for all that was written had a good and sensible meaning, and a great blessing was contained in the words on this paper. "'I never imagined anything like this,' said the paper, "'when I was only a little blue flower growing in the fields.' How could I fancy that I should ever be the means of bringing knowledge and joy to man? I cannot understand it myself, and yet it is really so. Heaven knows that I have done nothing myself, but what I was obliged to do with my weak powers for my own preservation, and yet I have been promoted from one joy to an honour to another. Each time I think that the song is ended, and then something higher and better begins for me. I suppose, now, I shall be sent on my travels about the world, so that people may read me. It cannot be otherwise, indeed, it is more than probable, for I have more splendid thoughts written upon me than I had pretty flowers in olden times. I am happier than ever. But the paper did not go on its travels. It was sent to the printer, and all the words written upon it were set up in type, to make a book, or rather many hundreds of books, for so many more persons could derive pleasure and profit from a printed book than from the written paper. And if the paper had been sent around the world, it would have been worn out before it had got half through its journey. This certainly is the wisest plan, said the written paper. I really did not think of that. I shall remain at home, and be held in honour like some old grandfather, as I really am to all these books. They will do some good." I could not have wandered about as they do, yet he who wrote all this has to look at me, as every word flowed from his pen upon my surface. I am the most honoured of all. Then the paper was tied in a bundle with other papers, and thrown into a tub that stood in the wash-house. After work, it is well to rest, said the paper, and a very good opportunity to collect one's thoughts. Now I am able, for the first time, to think of my real condition, and to know one's self is true progress. What will be done with me now, I wonder? No doubt I shall still go forward. I have always progressed hitherto, as I know quite well. 
Now it happened, one day, that all the paper in the tub was taken out, and laid on the hearth to be burnt. People said it could not be sold at the shop, to wrap up butter and sugar because it had been written upon. The children in the house stood round the stove, for they wanted to see the paper burn, because it flamed up so prettily, and afterwards among the ashes so many red sparks could be seen running one after the other, here and there, as quick as the wind. They called it seeing the children come out of school, and the last spark was the schoolmaster. They often thought the last spark had come, and one would cry, "'There goes the schoolmaster!' But the next moment another spark would appear, shining so beautifully. How they would like to know where the sparks all went to! Perhaps we shall find out some day, but we don't know now. The whole bundle of paper had been placed on the fire and was soon alight. Ah! Oh, cried the paper as it burst into a bright flame. Ah! Oh. It was certainly not very pleasant to be burning. But when the whole was wrapped in flames, the flames mounted up into the air, higher than the flax had ever been able to raise its little blue flower, and they glistened as the white linen never could have glistened. All the written letters became quite red in a moment, and all the words and thoughts turned to fire. "'Now I am mounting straight up to the sun,' said a voice in the flames. And it was as if a thousand voices echoed the words, and the flames departed up through the chimney and went out at the top. Then a number of tiny beings, as many in number as the flowers and the flax had been, and invisible to mortal eyes, floated above them. They were even lighter and more delicate than the flowers from which they were born, and as the flames were extinguished, and nothing remained of the paper but black ashes, these little beings danced upon it, and whenever they touched it, bright red sparks appeared. "'The children are all out of school, and the schoolmaster was the last of all,' said the children. "'It was good fun.' and they sang over the dead ashes, Snip, snap, stir, bass, sailor, the song is ended. But the little invisible being said, The song is never ended. The most beautiful is yet to come. But the children could neither hear nor understand this, nor should they, for children must not know everything. End of the Flax Recording by Samantha Gubitz Section 7 of Hans Christel Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853. Translated by H. P. Paul The Phoenix Bird In the garden of paradise, beneath the tree of knowledge, bloomed a rose-bush. Here, in the first rose, a bird was born. His flight was like the flashing of light, his plumage was beauteous, and his song ravishing. But when Eve plucked the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when she and Adam were driven from paradise, there fell from the flaming sword of the cherub a spark into the nest of the bird, which blazed up forthwith. The bird perished in the flames, but from the red egg in the nest there fluttered aloft a new one, the one solitary phoenix bird. The fable tells that he dwelt in Arabia, and that every hundred years he burnt himself to death in his nest but each time a new phoenix the only one in the world rises up from the red egg the bird flutters round us swift as a light beauteous in colour charming in song when the mother sits by her infant's cradle he stands on the pillow and with his wings forms a glory around the infant's head he flies through the chamber of content and brings sunshine into it and the violets on the humble table smell doubly sweet but a phoenix is not the bird of Arabia alone. He wings his way in the glimmer of the northern lights over the plains of Lapland, and hops among the yellow flowers in the short Greenland summer. Beneath the copper mountains of Fabloon and England's coal mines, he flies in the shape of a dusty moth over the hymn book that rests on the knees of the pious miner. On a lotus leaf, he floats down the sacred waters of the Ganges and the eye of the Hindu maid gleams bright when she beholds him. The phoenix bird, dost thou not know him? 
the bird of paradise, the holy swan of song. On the car of Thespis he sat in a guise of a chattering raven, and flapped his black wings smeared with a lease of wine. Of the sounding harp of Iceland swept the swan's red beak. On Shakespeare's shoulder he sat in a guise of Odin's raven, and whispered in the poet's ear, Immortality! And at the minstrel's feast he fluttered through the halls of the Vartbog. The phoenix bird, dost thou not know him? He sang to thee the Marseillaise, and thou kissedst the pen that fell from his wing. He came in the radiance of paradise, and perchance thou didst turn away from him towards the sparrow who sat with tinsel on his wings. The bird of paradise, renewed each century, born in flame, ending in flame. Thy picture, in a golden frame, hangs in the halls of the rich, for thou thyself often flies around, lonely, and disregarded, a myth, the phoenix of Arabia. In paradise, when thou wert born in the first rose, beneath the tree of knowledge, thou receivedst a kiss, and thy right name was given thee. Thy name, Poetry. End of the Phoenix Bird Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway the 25th of August, 2012. Section 8 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853, translated by H. P. Paul. A Story In the garden all the apple trees were in blossom. They had hastened to bring forth flowers before they got green leaves, and in the yard all the ducklings walked up and down, and the cat too. It basked in the sun and licked the sunshine from its own paws. And when one looked at the fields, how beautifully the corn stood and how green it shone, without comparison, and there was a twittering and a fluttering of all the little birds, as if the day were a great festival. And so it was, for it was Sunday. All the bells were ringing, and all the people went to church, looking cheerful and dressed in their best clothes. There was a look of cheerfulness on everything. The day was so warm and beautiful that one might well have said, God's kindness to us men is beyond all limits. But inside the church the pastor stood in the pulpit and spoke very loudly and angrily. He said that all men were wicked, and God would punish them for their sins, and that the wicked, when they died, would be cast into hell to burn for ever and ever. He spoke very excitedly, saying that their evil propensities would not be destroyed, nor would the fire be extinguished, and they should never find rest. That was terrible to hear, and he said it in such a tone of conviction. He described hell to them as a miserable hole, where all the refuse of the world gathers. There was no air beside the hot burning sulphur flame, and there was no ground under their feet. They, the wicked ones, sank deeper and deeper, while eternal silence surrounded them. It was dreadful to hear all that, for the preacher spoke from his heart, and all the people in the church were terrified. Meanwhile, the birds sang merrily outside, and the sun was shining so beautifully warm, it seemed as though every little flower said, God! Thy kindness towards us all is without limits. Indeed, outside it was not at all like the pastor's sermon. The same evening, upon going to bed, the pastor noticed his wife, sitting there quiet and pensive. "'What is the matter with you?' he asked her. "'Well, the matter with me is,' she said, "'that I cannot collect my thoughts, and I am unable to grasp the meaning of what you said today in church.' that there are so many wicked people, and that they should burn eternally. Alas! Eternally! How long! I am only a woman, and a sinner before God, but I should not have the heart to let even the worst sinner burn for ever, 
and how could our lord to do so who is so infinitely good and who knows how the wickedness comes from without and within no i am unable to imagine that although you say so it was autumn the trees dropped their leaves the earnest and severe pastor sat at the bedside of a dying person a pious faithful soul closed her eyes for ever she was the pastor's wife if any one shall find rest in the grave and mercy before our lord you shall certainly do so said the pastor he folded her hands and read a psalm over the dead woman she was buried two large tears rolled over the cheeks of the earnest man and in the parsonage it was empty and still for its sun had set for ever she had gone home it was night a cold wind swept over the pastor's head he opened his eyes and it seemed to him as if the moon was shining into his room it was not so however there was a being standing before his bed and looking like the ghost of his deceased wife she fixed her eyes upon him with such a kind and sad expression just as if she wished to say something to him the pastor raised himself in bed and stretched his arm towards her saying not even you can find eternal rest you suffer you best and most pious woman the dead woman nodded her head as if to say yes and put her hand on her breast and can i not obtain rest in the grave for you yes was the answer and how give me one hair only one single hair from the head of the sinner for whom the fire shall never be extinguished of the sinner whom god will condemn to eternal punishment in hell yes one ought to be able to redeem you so easily you pure pious woman follow me said the dead woman it is thus granted to us by my side you will be able to fly wherever your thoughts wish to go invisible to men we shall penetrate into their most secret chambers but with sure hand you must find out him who is destined to eternal torture and before the cock crows he must be found as quickly as if carried by the winged thoughts they were in the great city and from the walls the names of the deadly sins shone in flaming letters pride avarice drunkenness wantonness in short the whole seven-coloured bow of sin yes therein i believed as i knew it said the pastor are living those who are abandoned to the eternal fire and they were standing before the magnificent illuminated gate the broad steps were adorned with carpets and flowers and dance music was sounding through the festive halls a footman dressed in silk and velvet stood with a large silver mounted rod near the entrance our ball can compare favourably with the king's he said and turned with contempt towards the gazing crowd in the street what he thought was sufficiently expressed in his features and movements miserable beggars who are looking in you are nothing in comparison to me pride said the dead woman do you see him the footman asked the pastor he is but a poor fool and not doomed to be tortured eternally by fire only a fool it sounded through the whole house of pride they were all fools there then they flew within the four naked walls of the miser lean as a skeleton trembling with cold and hunger the old man was clinging with all his thoughts to his money they saw him jump up feverishly from his miserable couch and take a loose stone out of the wall there lay gold coins in an old stocking they saw him anxiously feeling over an old ragged coat in which pieces of gold were sewn, and his clammy fingers trembled. He is ill. That is madness. A joyless madness, besieged by fair and dreadful dreams. They quickly went away and came before the beds of the criminals. These unfortunate people slept side by side in long rows. Like a ferocious animal, one of them rose out of his sleep and uttered a horrible cry, and gave his comrade a violent dig in the ribs with his pointed elbow and this one turned round in his sleep be quiet monster sleep this happens every night every night repeated the other yes every night he comes and tortures me in my violence i have done this and that 
I was born with an evil mind, which has brought me hither for the second time. But if I have done wrong, I suffer punishment for it. One thing, however, I have not yet confessed. When I came out a little while ago, and passed by the yard of my former master, evil thoughts rose within me when I remembered this and that. I struck a match a little bit on the wall. Probably it came a little too close to the thatched roof. All burned down. A great heat rose, such as sometimes overcomes me. I myself helped to rescue cattle and things. Nothing alive burnt except a flight of pigeons, which flew into the fire, and the yard-dog, of which I had not thought. One could hear him howl out of the fire, and this howling I still hear when I wish to sleep. And when I have fallen asleep, the great rough dog comes and places himself upon me, and howls, presses, and tortures me. Now listen to what I tell you. You can snore. You are snoring the whole night, and I hardly a quarter of an hour. And the blood rose to the head of the excited criminal. He threw himself upon his comrade, and beat him with his clenched fists in the face. Wicked Mats has become mad again, they said amongst themselves. The other criminals seized him, wrestled with him, and bent him double, so that his head rested between his knees, and they tied him, so that the blood almost came out of his eyes, and out of all his pores. "'You are killing the unfortunate man,' said the pastor, and as he stretched out his hand to protect him, who had already suffered too much, the scene changed. They flew through rich holes and wretched howls, wantonness and envy, all the deadly sins, passed before them. An angel of justice read their crimes and their defence. The latter was not a brilliant one, but it was read before God, who reads the heart, who knows everything, the wickedness that comes from within and from without, who is mercy and love personified. The pastor's hand trembled. He dared not stretch it out. He did not venture to pull a hair out of the sinner's head. And tears gushed from his eyes like a stream of mercy and love, the cooling waters of which extinguished the eternal fire of hell. Just then the cock crowed. Father of mercy, grant thou to her the peace that I was unable to procure for her. I have it now, said the dead woman. It was your hard words, your despair of mankind, your gloomy belief in God and his creation, which drove me to you. Learn to know mankind, even in the wicked ones, lives a part of God, and this extinguishes and conquers the flame of hell. The pastor felt a kiss on his lips. A gleam of light surrounded him. God's bright sun shone into the room, and his wife, alive, sweet and full of love, awoke him from a dream which God had sent him. End of a story Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway The 27th of August, 2012《Section 9 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen translated by H P Paul the puppet show man on board a steamer I once met an elderly man with such a merry face that if it was really an index of his mind he must have been the happiest fellow in creation and indeed he considered himself so for I heard it from his own mouth he was a Dane the owner of a travelling theatre. He had all his company with him in a large box, for he was the proprietor of a puppet show. His inborn cheerfulness, he said, had been tested by a member of the Polytechnic Institution, and the experiment had made him completely happy. I did not at first understand all this, but afterwards he explained the whole story to me, and here it is. I was giving a representation, he said, in the hall of the posting-house in the little town of Slagelsi. 
there was a splendid audience entirely juvenile excepting two respectable matrons all at once a person in black of student-like appearance entered the room and sat down he laughed aloud at the telling points and applauded quite at the proper time this was a very unusual spectator for me and i felt anxious to know who he was i heard that he was a member of the polytechnic institution of copenhagen who had been sent out to lecture to the people in the provinces punctually at eight o'clock my performance closed for children must go early to bed and a manager must also consult the convenience of the public at nine o'clock the lecturer commenced his lecture and his experiments and then i formed a part of his audience it was wonderful both to hear and to see the greater part of it was beyond my comprehension but it led me to think that if we men can acquire so much we must surely be intended to last longer than the little span which extends only to the time when we are hidden away under the earth his experiments were quite miracles on a small scale and yet the explanations flowed as naturally as water from his lips at the time of moses and the prophets such a man would have been placed among the sages of the land in the middle ages they would have burnt him at the stake all night long i could not sleep and the next evening when i gave another performance and the lecturer was present i was in one of my best moods i once heard of an actor who when he had to act the part of a lover always thought of one particular lady in the audience he only played for her and forgot all the rest of the house and now the polytechnic lecturer was my she my only auditor for whom alone i played when the performance was over and the puppets removed behind the curtain the polytechnic lecturer invited me into his room to take a glass of wine he talked of my comedies and i of his science and i believe we were both equally pleased but i had the best of it for there was much in what he did that he could not always explain to me for instance why a piece of iron which is rubbed on a cylinder should become magnetic how does this happen magnetic sparks come to it but how it is the same with people in the world they are rubbed about on this spherical globe till the electric spark comes upon them and then we have a napoleon or a luther or someone of the kind the whole world is but a series of miracles said the lecturer but we are so accustomed to them that we call them everyday matters and he went on explaining things to me till my skull seemed lifted from my brain and i declared that were i not such an old fellow i would at once become a member of the polytechnic institution that i might learn to look at the bright side of everything although i was one of the happiest of men one of the happiest said the lecturer as if the idea pleased him are you really happy yes i replied for i am welcomed in every town when i arrive with my company but i certainly have one wish which sometimes weighs upon my cheerful temper like a mountain of lead i should like to become the manager of a real theatre and the director of a real troupe of men and women i understand he said you would like to have life breathed into your puppets so that they might be living actors and you their director and would you then be quite happy i said i believed so but he did not and we talked it over in all manner of ways yet could not agree on the subject however the wine was excellent and we clanked our glasses together as we drank there must have been magic in it or i should have certainly become tipsy but that did not happen for my mind seemed quite clear and indeed a kind of sunshine filled the room and beamed from the eyes of the polytechnic lecturer it made me think of the old stories when the gods in their immortal youth wandered upon this earth and paid visits to mankind i said so to him and he smiled and i could have sworn that he was one of those ancient deities in disguise or at all events that he belonged to the race of the gods the result seemed to prove i was right in my suspicions for it was arranged that my highest wish should be granted that my puppets were to be gifted with life and that i was to be the manager of a real company we drank to my success and clanked our glasses then he packed all my dolls into the box and fastened it on my back and i felt as if i were spinning round in a circle 
and presently found myself lying on the floor i remember that quite well and then the whole company sprang from the box the spirit had come upon us all the puppets had become distinguished actors at least so they said themselves and i was their director when all was ready for the first representation the whole company requested permission to speak to me before appearing in public the dancing lady said the house could not be supported unless she stood on one leg for she was a great genius and begged to be treated as such the lady who acted the part of the queen expected to be treated as a queen off the stage as well as on it or else she said she could get out of practice the man whose duty it was to deliver a letter gave himself as many airs as he who took the part of the first lover in the piece he declared that the inferior parts were as important as the great ones and deserving equal consideration as parts of an artistic whole the hero of the piece would only play in a part containing points likely to bring down the applause of the house the prima donna would only act when the lights were red for she declared that a blue light did not suit her complexion it was like a company of flies in a bottle and i was in the bottle with them for i was the director my breath was taken away my head whirled and i was as miserable as a man could be it was quite a novel strange set of beings among whom i now found myself i only wished i had them all in my box again and that i had never been their director so i told them roundly that after all they were nothing but puppets and then they killed me after a while i found myself lying on my bed in my room but how i got there or how i got away at all from the polytechnic professor he may perhaps know i don't the moon shone upon the floor the box lay open and the dolls were all scattered about in great confusion but i was not idle i jumped off the bed and into the box they all had to go some on their heads some on their feet then i shut down the lid and seated myself upon the box now you'll have to stay said i and i shall be cautious how i wish you flesh and blood again i felt quite light my cheerfulness had returned and i was the happiest of mortals the polytechnic professor had fully cured me i was as happy as a king and went to sleep on the box next morning correctly speaking it was noon for i slept remarkably late that day i found myself still sitting there in happy consciousness that my former wish had been a foolish one i inquired for the polytechnic professor but he had disappeared like the greek and roman gods from that time i have been the happiest of men in the world i am a happy director for none of my company ever grumble nor the public either for i always make them merry i can arrange my pieces just as i please i choose out of every comedy what i like best and no one is offended plays that are neglected nowadays by the great public were run after thirty years ago and listened to till the tears ran down the cheeks of the audience these are the pieces i bring forward i place them before the little ones who cry over them as papa and mamma used to cry thirty years ago but i make them shorter for the youngsters don't like long speeches and if they have anything mournful they like it to be over quickly End of the Puppet Show Man Section 10 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Pamela Krantz Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848-1853, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. The Dumb Book, 1851. In the high road which led through a wood stood a solitary farmhouse. The road, in fact, ran right through its yard. The sun was shining and all the windows were open. Within the house people were very busy. In the yard, in an arbor formed by lilac bushes in full bloom, stood an open coffin. Thither they had carried a dead man, who was to be buried that very afternoon. Nobody shed a tear over him. His face was covered over with a white cloth. 
Under his head they had placed a large, thick book, the leaves of which consisted of folded sheets of blotting paper, and withered flowers lay between them. It was the herbarium, which he had gathered in various places, and was to be buried with him, according to his own wish. Every one of the flowers in it was connected with some chapter of his life. "'Who is the dead man?' we asked. "'The old student,' was the reply. "'They say that he was once an energetic young man, that he studied the dead languages, and sang and even composed many songs.' Then something had happened to him, and in consequence of this he gave himself up to drink, body, and mind. When at last he had ruined his health, they brought him into the country, where someone paid for his board and residence. He was gentle as a child as long as the sullen mood did not come over him, but when it came he was fierce, became as strong as a giant, and ran about in the wood like a chaste deer. But when we succeeded in bringing him home, and prevailed upon him to open the book with the dried-up plants in it, he would sometimes sit for a whole day looking at this or that plant, while frequently the tears rolled over his cheeks. God knows what was in his mind, but he requested us to put the book into his coffin, and now he lies there. In a little while the lid will be placed upon the coffin, and he will have sweet rest in the grave. The cloth which covered his face was lifted up. The dead man's face expressed peace. A sunbeam fell upon it. A swallow flew with the swiftness of an arrow into the arbor, turning in its flight, and twittered over the dead man's head. What a strange feeling it is, surely we all know it, to look through old letters of our young days. A different life rises up out of the past, as it were, with all its hopes and sorrows. How many of the people with whom in those days we used to be on intimate terms appear to us as if dead, and yet they are still alive, only we have not thought of them for such a long time, whom we imagined we should retain in our memories forever, and share every joy and sorrow with them. The withered oak leaf in the book here recalled the friend, the schoolfellow, who was to be his friend for life. He fixed the leaf to the student's cap in the green wood, when they vowed eternal friendship. Where does he dwell now? The leaf is kept, but the friendship does no longer exist. Here is a foreign hothouse plant, too tender for the gardens of the north. It is almost as if its leaves still smelt sweet. She gave it to him out of her own garden, a nobleman's daughter. Here is a water-lily that he had plucked himself and watered with salt tears, a lily of sweet water. And here is a nettle. What may its leaves tell us? What might he have thought when he plucked and kept it? Here is a little snowdrop out of the solitary wood. Here is an evergreen from the flower-pot at the tavern. And here is a simple blade of grass. The lilac bends its fresh, fragrant flowers over the dead man's head. The swallow passes again. Twit! Twit! Now the men come with hammer and nails. The lid is placed over the dead man, while his head rests on the dumb book. So long cherished, now closed forever. End of the Dumb Book Recording by Pamela Krantz Section 11 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Kukolo. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. THE OLD GRAVESTONE In a house, with a large courtyard, in a provincial town, at that time of the year in which people say the evenings are growing longer, a family circle were gathered together at their old home. A lamp burned on the table, although the weather was mild and warm, and the long curtains hung down before the open windows, and without the moon shone brightly in the dark blue sky. But they were not talking of the moon, but of a large old stone that lay below in the courtyard, not very far from the kitchen door. 
the maids often laid the clean copper saucepans and kitchen vessels on this stone that they might dry in the sun and the children were fond of playing on it it was in fact an old gravestone yes said the master of the house i believe the stone came from the graveyard of the old church of the convent which was pulled down and the pulpit the monuments and the gravestones sold my father bought the latter most of them were cut in two and used for paving stones, but that one stone was preserved whole and laid in the courtyard. Anyone can see that it is a gravestone, said the eldest of the children. The representation of an hourglass and part of the figure of an angel can still be traced, but the inscription beneath is quite worn out, excepting the name Preben and a large S close by it, and a little farther down the name of Martha can be easily read but nothing more and even that cannot be seen unless it has been raining or when we have washed the stone dear me how singular why that must be the gravestone of preben schwan and his wife the old man who said this looked old enough to be the grandfather of all present in the room yes he continued these people were among the last who were buried in the church of the old convent they were a very worthy old couple I can remember them well in the days of my boyhood. Everyone knew them, and they were esteemed by all. They were the oldest residents in the town, and people said they possessed a ton of gold, yet they were always very plainly dressed, in the coarsest stuff, but with linen of the purest whiteness. Preben and Martha were a fine old couple, and when they both sat on the bench at the top of the steep stone steps, in front of their house, with the branches of the linden tree waving above them and nodded in a gentle friendly way to passers-by it really made one feel quite happy they were very good to the poor they fed them and clothed them and in their benevolence there was judgment as well as true christianity the old woman died first that day is still quite vividly before my eyes I was a little boy and had accompanied my father to the old man's house. Martha had fallen into the sleep of death just as we arrived there. The corpse lay in a bedroom near to the one in which we sat, and the old man was in great distress and weeping like a child. He spoke to my father and to a few neighbors who were there of how lonely he should feel now she was gone and how good and true she his dead wife had been during the number of years that they had passed through life together and how they had become acquainted and learnt to love each other i was as i have said a boy and only stood by and listened to what the other said but it filled me with a strange emotion to listen to the old man and to watch how the colour rose in his cheeks as he spoke of the days of their courtship of how beautiful she was and how many little tricks he had been guilty of that he might meet her and then he talked of his wedding day and his eyes brightened and he seemed to be carried back by his words to that joyful time and yet there she was lying in the next room dead an old woman and he was an old man speaking of the days of hope long passed away ah well so it is then i was but a child and now i am old as old as preben schwan then was time passes away and all things changed i can remember quite well the day on which she was buried and how old preben walked close behind the coffin a few years before this time the old couple had had their gravestone prepared with an inscription and their names but not the date in the evening the stone was taken to the churchyard and laid on the grave a year later it was taken up that old preben might be laid by the side of his wife they did not leave behind them wealth they left behind them far less than people had believed they possessed what there was went to families distantly related to them of whom till then no one had ever heard this old house with its balcony of wicker work and the bench at the top of the high steps under the lime tree was considered by the road inspectors too old and rotten to be left standing afterwards when the same fate befell the convent church 
and the graveyard was destroyed the gravestone of preben and martha like everything else was sold to whoever would buy it and so it happened that this stone was not cut in two as many others had been but now lies in the courtyard below a scouring block for the maids and a playground for the children the paved street now passes over the resting place of old Prev and his wife no one thinks of them any more now and the old man who had spoken of all this shook his head mournfully and said forgotten ah yes everything will be forgotten and then the conversation turned on other matters but the youngest child in the room a boy with large earnest eyes mounted upon a chair behind the window curtains and looked out into the yard where the moon was pouring a flood of light on the old gravestone the stone that had always appeared to him so dull and flat but which lay there now like a great leaf out of a book of history all that the boy had heard of old Prebin and his wife seemed clearly defined on the stone, and as he gazed on it and glanced at the clear, bright moon shining in the pure air, it was as if the light of God's countenance beamed over his beautiful world. Forgotten. Everything will be forgotten. Still echoed through the room, and in the same moment an invisible spirit whispered to the heart of the boy, preserve carefully the seed that has been entrusted to thee that it may grow and thrive guard it well through thee my child shall the obliterated inscription in the old weather-beaten gravestone go forth to future generations in clear golden characters the old pair shall again wander through the streets arm in arm or sit with their fresh healthy cheeks on the bench under the lime tree and smile and nod at rich and poor the seed of this hour shall ripen in the course of years into a beautiful poem the beautiful and the good are never forgotten they live always in story and in song end of the old gravestone recording by ginger cuckolo Section 12 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol DeRose. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Conceited Apple Branch It was the month of May. The wind still blew cold, but from bush and tree, field and flower, came the welcome sound, Spring is come. Wild flowers in profusion covered the hedges. Under the little apple tree, spring seemed busy, and told his tale from one of the branches which hung fresh and blooming and covered with delicate pink blossoms that were just ready to open. The branch well knew how beautiful it was. This knowledge exists as much in the leaf as in the blood. I was therefore not surprised when a nobleman's carriage, in which sat the young countess, stopped in the road just by. She said that an ample branch was a most lovely object, and an emblem of spring in its most charming aspect. Then the branch was broken off for her, and she held it in her delicate hand and sheltered it with her silk parasol. Then they drove to the castle, in which were lofty halls and splendid drawing rooms. Pure white curtains fluttered before the open windows, and beautiful flowers stood in shining transparent vases, and in one of them, which looked as if it had been cut out of newly fallen snow, the apple branch was placed among some fresh, light twigs of beech. It was a charming sight. Then the branch became proud, which was very much like human nature. People of every description entered the room, and according to their position in society, so dared they to express their admiration. Some few said nothing. Others expressed too much, 
and the apple branch very soon got to understand that there was as much difference in the characters of human beings as in those of plants and flowers. Some are all for pomp and parade. Others have a great deal to do to maintain their own importance, while the rest might be spared without much loss to society. So thought the apple branch as he stood before the open window, from which he could see out over gardens and fields, where there were flowers and plants enough for him to think and reflect upon, some rich and beautiful, some poor and humble indeed. Poor despised herbs, said the apple branch. There really is a difference between them and such as I am. How unhappy they must be, if they can feel as those in my position do. There is a difference indeed, and so there ought to be, or we should all be equals. And the apple branch looked with a sort of pity upon them, especially on a certain little flower that is found in fields and in ditches. No one bound these flowers together in a nosegay. They were too common. They were even known to grow between the paving stones, shooting up everywhere like bad weeds, and they bore the very ugly name of dog flowers or dandelions. Poor despised plants, said the apple bough. It is not your fault that you are so ugly and that you have such an ugly name, but it is with plants as with men. There must be a difference. A difference, cried the sunbeam as he kissed the blooming apple branch and then kissed the yellow dandelion out in the fields. All were brothers, and the sunbeam kissed them, the poor flowers as well as the rich. The apple bough had never thought of the boundless love of God, which extends over all the works of creation, over everything which lives and moves and has its being in him. He had never thought of the good and beautiful which are so often hidden, but can never remain forgotten by him, not only among the lower creation, but also among men. The sunbeam, the ray of light, knew better. You do not see very far nor very clearly, he said to the apple branch. Which is the despised plant you so specially pity? The dandelion, he replied. No one ever places it in a nosegay. It is often trodden underfoot, there are so many of them. And when they run to seed, they have flowers like wool, which fly away in little pieces over the roads and cling to the dresses of the people. They are only weeds, but of course there must be weeds. Oh, I am really very thankful that I was not made like one of these flowers. There came presently across the fields a whole group of children, the youngest of whom was so small that it had to be carried by the others. And when he was seated on the grass, among the yellow flowers, he laughed aloud with joy, kicked out his little legs, rolled about, plucked the yellow flowers, and kissed them in childlike innocence. The elder children broke off the flowers with long stems, bent the stalks one round the other to form links, and made first a chain for the neck, then one to go across the shoulders and hang down to the waist, and at last a wreath to wear round the head, so that they looked quite splendid in their garlands of green stems and golden flowers. But the eldest among them gathered carefully the faded flowers, on the stem of which was grouped together the seed, in the form of a white feathery coronal. These loose, airy wool flowers are very beautiful and look like fine snowy feathers or down. The children held them to their mouths and tried to blow away the whole coronal with one puff of the breath. They had been told by their grandmothers that whoever did so would be sure to have new clothes before the end of the year. The despised flower was by this raised to the position of a prophet or foreteller of events. Do you see, said the sunbeam, do you see the beauty of these flowers? Do you see their powers of giving pleasure? Yes, to children, said the apple bough. By and by an old woman came into the field, and with a blunt knife without a handle, began to dig round the roots of some of the dandelion plants and pull them up. With some of these she intended to make tea for herself, but the rest she was going to sell to the chemist and obtain some money. But beauty is of higher value than all this, 
said the apple tree branch. Only the chosen ones can be admitted into the realms of the beautiful. There is a difference between plants, just as there is a difference between men. Then the sunbeam spoke of the boundless love of God as seen in creation and over all that lives, and of the equal distribution of his gifts, both in time and in eternity. That is your opinion, said the apple bough. Then some people came into the room, and among them the young countess, the lady who had placed the apple bough in the transparent vase so pleasantly beneath the rays of the sunlight. She carried in her hand something that seemed like a flower. The object was hidden by two or three great leaves which covered it like a shield, so that no draft or gust of wind could injure it, and it was carried more carefully than the apple branch had ever been. Very cautiously the large leaves were removed, and there appeared the feathery seed crown of the despised dandelion. This was what the lady had so carefully plucked, and carried home so safely covered, so that not one of the delicate feathery arrows of which its mist-like shape was so lightly formed should flutter away. She now drew it forth quite uninjured, and wondered at its beautiful form and airy lightness and singular construction, so soon to be blown away by the wind. See, she exclaimed, how wonderfully God has made this little flower. I will paint it with the apple branch together. Everyone admires the beauty of the apple bough, but this humble flower has been endowed by heaven with another kind of loveliness, and although they differ in appearance, both are the children of the realms of beauty. Then the sunbeam kissed the lowly flower, and he kissed the blooming apple branch, upon whose leaves appeared a rosy blush. End of the Conceited Apple Branch. Recording by Carol D. Rose. Section 13 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. The Loveliest Rose in the World There lived once a great queen, in whose garden were found at all seasons the most splendid flowers, and from every land in the world. She especially loved roses and therefore she possessed the most beautiful varieties of this flower from the wild hedge-rose with its apple-scented leaves to the splendid provence rose they grew near the shelter of the walls wound themselves round columns and window frames crept along passages and over the ceilings of the halls they were of every fragrance and colour but care and sorrow dwelt within these halls the queen lay upon a sick-bed and the doctors declared that she must die. There is still one thing that could save her, said one of the wisest among them. Bring her the loveliest rose in the world, one which exhibits the purest and brightest love, and if it is brought to her before her eyes close, she will not die. Then from all parts came those who brought roses that bloomed in every garden, but they were not the right sort. The flower must be won from the garden of love. But which of the roses there showed forth the highest and purest love? The poet sang of this rose, the loveliest in the world, and each named one which he considered worthy of that title. And intelligence of what was required was sent far and wide to every heart that beat with love, to every class, age, and condition. No one has yet named the flower, said the wise man no one has pointed out the spot where it blooms in all its splendour it is not a rose from the coffin of romeo and juliet or from the grave of walberg though these roses will live in everlasting song it is not one of the roses which sprouted forth from the blood-stained fame of winkelried the blood which flows from the breast of a hero who dies for his country is sacred 
and his memory is sweet and no rose can be redder than the blood which flows from his veins neither is it the magic flower of science to obtain which wondrous flower a man devotes many an hour of his fresh young life in sleepless nights in a lonely chamber i know where it blooms said a happy mother who came with her lovely child to the bedside of the queen i know where the loveliest rose in the world is it is seen on the blooming cheeks of my sweet child when it expresses the pure and holy love of infancy when refreshed by sleep it opens its eyes and smiles upon me with childlike affection this is a lovely rose said the wise man but there is one still more lovely yes one far more lovely said one of the women i have seen it and a loftier and purer rose does not bloom but it was white like the leaves of a blush rose i saw it on the cheeks of the queen she had taken off her golden crown and through the long dreary night she carried her sick child in her arms she wept over it kissed it and prayed for it as only a mother can pray in that hour of her anguish holy and wonderful in its might is the white rose of grief but it is not the one we seek no the loveliest rose in the world i saw at the lord's table said the good old bishop i saw it shine as if an angel's face had appeared a young maiden knelt at the altar and renewed the vows she made at her baptism and there were white roses and red roses on the blushing cheeks of that young girl she looked up to heaven with all the purity and love of her young spirit in all the expression of the highest and purest love may she be blessed said the wise man but no one has yet named the loveliest rose in the world then came into the room a child the queen's little son tears stood in his eyes and glistened on his cheeks as he carried a great book and the binding was of velvet with silver clasps mother cried the little boy only hear what i have read and the child seated himself at the bedside and read from the book of him who suffered death on the cross to save all men even who are yet unborn he read greater love hath no man than this and as he read a roseate hue spread over the cheeks of the queen and her eyes became so enlightened and clear that she saw from the leaves of the book a lovely rose spring forth a type of him who shed his blood on the cross i see it she said he who beholds this the loveliest rose on earth shall never die end of the loveliest rose in the world Section 14 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. 1848 to 1853 translated by h b paul in a thousand years yes in a thousand years people will fly on the wings of steam through the air over the ocean the young inhabitants of america will become visitors of old europe they will come over to see the monuments and the great cities which will then be in ruins just as we in our time make pilgrimages to the tottering splendours of southern asia in a thousand years they will come the thames the danube and the rhine still roll their course mount blanc stands firm in its snow-capped summit and the northern lights gleam over the land of the north but generation after generation has become dust a whole rows of the mighty of the moment are forgotten like those who already slumber under the hill on which the rich trader whose ground it is has built a bench on which he can sit and look out across his waving cornfields to europe cried the young sons of america to the land of our ancestors the glorious land of monuments and fancy to europe the ship of the air comes 
it is crowded with passengers, for the transit is quicker than by sea. The electromagnetic wire under the ocean has already telegraphed the number of the aerial caravan. Europe is in sight. It is the coast of Ireland that they can see, but the passengers are still asleep. They will not be called till they are exactly over England. There they will first step on European shore, in the land of Shakespeare, as the educated call it, in the land of politics, the land of machines, as it is called by others. Here they stay a whole day. That is all the time the busy race can devote to the whole of England and Scotland. Then the journey is continued through the tunnel under the English Channel to France, the land of Charlemagne and Napoleon. Molière is named. The learned men talk of the classic school of remote antiquity. There is rejoicing and shouting for the names of heroes, poets, and men of science, whom our time does not know, but who will be born after our time in Paris, the centre of Europe, and elsewhere. The air steamboat flies over the country whence Columbus went forth, where Cortes was born, and where Calderon sang dramas in sounding verse. A beautiful black-eyed woman lives still in the blooming valleys, and the oldest songs speak of the Cid and Alhambra. Then through the air, over the sea, to Italy, where once lay old, everlasting Rome. It has vanished. The Campagna lines desert. A single ruined wall is shown as the remains of St. Peter's, but there is a doubt if this ruin be genuine. Next to Greece, to sleep a night in the Grand Hotel, at the top of Mount Olympus, to say that they have been there, and the journey is continued to the Bosphorus, to rest there a few hours, and see the place where Byzantium lay, and where the legend tells that a harem stood in the time of the Turks, poor fishermen are now spreading their nets. Over the remains of mighty cities on the broad Danube, cities which we in our time know not, the travellers pass. But here and there, on the rich sites of those that time shall bring forth, the caravan sometimes descends and departs thence again. Down below lies Germany, that was once covered with a close net of railway and canals. The region where Luther spoke, where Goethe sang, and Mozart once held a sceptre of harmony. Great names shine there, in science and in art, names that are unknown to us. One day, devoted to seeing Germany, and one for the north, the country of Ersted and Linus, and for Norway, the land of the old heroes and the young Normans. Iceland is visited on the journey home. The geysers burn no more. Hecla is an extinct volcano, but the rocky islands is still fixed in the midst of the foaming sea, a continual monument of legend and poetry. There is really a great deal to be seen in Europe, says the young American, and we have seen it in a week, according to the directions of the great traveller, and here he mentions the name of one of his contemporaries, in his celebrated work, How to See All Europe in a Week. End of In a Thousand Years Recording by Christine G. In Oslo, Norway The 1st of September, 2012Section 15 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ratandeep Satwan Singh. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. The Swan's Nest Between the Baltic and the North Sea, there lies an old swan's nest, wherein swans are born and have been born that shall never die. In olden times, a flock of swans flew over the Alps to the green plains around Milan, where it was delightful to dwell. This flight of swans' men called the Lombard, Another flock 
with shining plumage and honest eyes, soared southwards to Byzantium. The songs established themselves there close by the emperor's throne and spread their wings over him as shields to protect him. They received the name of Varangians. On the coast of France there sounded a cry of fear for the blood-stained songs that came from the north with fire under their wings. And the people prayed, Heaven deliver us from the wild northmen. On the fresh sward of England stood the Danish son by the open seashore with the crown of three kingdoms on his head, and he stretched out his golden scepter over the land. The heathens on the Pomerian coast bent the knee, and the Danish swans came with the banner of the cross and with the drawn sword. That was in the very old times, you say. In later days, two mighty swans have been seen to fly from the nest. A light shone far through the air, far over the lands of the earth. The swan, with the strong beating of his wings, scattered the twilight mists, and the starry sky was seen, and it was as if it came nearer to the earth that was the swan Tycho Brahe. Yes, then, you say, but in our own days. We have seen son after son soar by in glorious flight. One let his pinions glide over the strings of the golden harp, and it resounded through the north. Norway's mountains seemed to rise higher in the sunlight of former days. There was a rustling among the pine trees and the birches. The gods of the north, the heroes, and the noble women showed themselves in the dark forest depths. We have seen a son beat with his wings upon the marble crag, so that it burst, and the forms of beauty imprisoned in the stone stepped out to the sunny day, and men in the lands round about lifted up their heads to behold these mighty forms. We have seen a third son spinning the thread of thought that is fastened from country to country round the world so that the word may fly with lightning speed from land to land. And our Lord loves the old son's nest between the Baltic and the North Sea. And then the mighty birds come soaring through the air to destroy it. Even the callow young stand round in a circle on the margin of the nest. And though their breasts may be stuck so that their blood flows, they bear it and strike with their wings and their claws. Centuries will pass by, songs will fly forth from the nest, men will see them and hear them in the world, before it shall be said in spirit and in truth, this is the last swan, the last song from the swan's nest. End of The Swan's Nest Recording by Ratan Deep Satwan Singh, Jamshedpur, India Section 16 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Miles. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853. By Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Story of the Year It was near the end of January, and a terrible fall of snow was pelting down and whirling through the streets and lanes. The windows were plastered with snow on the outside. Snow fell in masses from the roofs. Everyone seemed in a great hurry. They ran, they flew, fell into each other's arms holding fast for a moment as long as they could stand safely. Coaches and horses looked as if they had been frosted with sugar. The footmen stood with their backs against the carriages, so as to turn their faces from the wind. The foot-passengers kept within the shelter of the carriages, which could only move slowly on in the deep snow. At last the storm abated, and a narrow path was swept clean in front of the houses. When two persons met in this path they stood still, for neither liked to take the first step on one side into the deep snow to let the other pass him. 
there they stood, silent and motionless, till at last, as if by tacit consent, they each sacrificed a leg and buried it in the deep snow. Towards evening the weather became calm. The sky, cleared from the snow, looked more lofty and transparent, while the stars shone with new brightness and purity. The frozen snow crackled underfoot, and was quite firm enough to bear the sparrows, who hopped upon it in the morning dawn. They searched for food in the path which had been swept, but there was very little for them, and they were terribly cold. "'Tweet, tweet,' said one to another. "'They call this a new year, but I think it is worse than the last. We might just as well have kept the old year. I'm quite unhappy, and I have a right to be so.' "'Yes, you have, and yet the people ran about and fired off guns to usher in the new year,' said a little shivering sparrow. "'They threw things against the doors, and were quite beside themselves with joy, because the old year disappeared. I was glad, too, for I expected we should have some warm days, but my hopes have come to nothing. It freezes harder than ever. I think mankind have made a mistake in reckoning time.' "'That they have,' said a third, an old sparrow with a white pole. "'They have something they call a calendar. It's an invention of their own, and everything must be arranged according to it. But it won't do. When spring comes, then the year begins. It is the voice of nature, and I reckon by that.' "'But when will spring come?' asked the others. "'It will come when the stork returns, but he is very uncertain and here in the town no one knows anything about it. In the country they have more knowledge. Shall we fly away and wait? We shall be nearer to spring then, certainly. That may be all very well, said another sparrow, who had been hopping about for a long time, chirping, but not saying anything of consequence. But I have found a few comforts here in town, which I'm afraid I should miss out in the country. Here in this neighborhood there lives a family of people who have been so sensible as to place three or four flower-pots against the wall in the courtyard so that the openings are all turned inward, and the bottom of each points outward. In the latter a hole has been cut large enough for me to fly in and out. I and my husband have built a nest in one of these pots, and all our young ones, who have now flown away, were brought up there. The people who live there, of course, made the whole arrangement that they might have the pleasure of seeing us, or they would not have done it. It pleased them also to strew bread-crumbs for us, and so we have food, and may consider ourselves provided for. So I think my husband and I will stay where we are, although we are not very happy, but we shall stay. And we will fly into the country, said the others, to see if spring is coming. And away they flew. In the country it was really winter, a few degrees colder than in the town. The sharp winds blew over the snow-covered fields. The farmer, wrapped in warm clothing, sat in his sleigh, and beat his arms across his chest to keep off the cold. The whip lay on his lap. The horses ran till they smoked. The snow crackled, the sparrows hopped about in the wheel-ruts, and shivered, crying, Tweet, tweet, when will spring come? It is very long in coming. Very long indeed, sounded over the field, from the nearest snow-covered hill. It might have been the echo which people heard, or perhaps the words of that wonderful old man, who sat high on a heap of snow, regardless of wind or weather. He was all in white, he had on a peasant's coarse white coat of frieze. He had long white hair, a pale face, and large clear blue eyes. "'Who is that old man?' asked the sparrows. "'I know who he is,' said an old raven, who sat on the fence, and was condescending enough to acknowledge that we are all equal in the sight of heaven, even as little birds, and therefore he talked with the sparrows, and gave them the information they wanted. "'I know who the old man is,' he said. "'It is winter, the old man of last year. He is not dead yet, as the calendar says.' but acts as guardian to little Prince Spring who is coming. Winter rules here still. Ugh! The cold makes you shiver, little ones, does it not? There! Did I not tell you so? said the smallest of the sparrows. The calendar is only an invention of man, and is not arranged according to nature. 
they should leave these things to us. We are created so much more clever than they are. One week passed, and then another. The forest looked dark. The hard, frozen lake lay like a sheet of lead. The mountains had disappeared, for over the land hung damp, icy mists. Large black crows flew about in silence. It was as if nature slept. At length a sunbeam glided over the lake, and it shone like burnished silver. But the snow on the fields and the hills did not glitter as before. The white form of winter sat there still, with his on-wandering gaze fixed on the south. He did not perceive that the snowy carpet seemed to sink as it were into the earth, that here and there a little green patch of grass appeared, and that these patches were covered with sparrows. Tweet, tweet, is spring coming at last? Spring! How the cry resounded over field and meadow, and through the dark brown woods, where the fresh green moss still gleamed on the trunks of the trees, and from the south came the two first storks flying through the air, and on the back of each sat a lovely little child, a boy and a girl. They greeted the earth with a kiss, and wherever they placed their feet white flowers sprung up from beneath the snow. Hand in hand they approached the old ice-man, winter, embraced him and clung to his breast, and as they did so, in a moment all three were enveloped in a thick, damp mist, dark and heavy, that closed over them like a veil. The wind arose with mighty rustling tone, and cleared away the mist. Then the sun shone out warmly. Winter had vanished away, and the beautiful children of spring sat on the throne of the year. "'This is really a new year,' cried all the sparrows. "'Now we shall get our rights, and have some return for what we suffered in winter.' Wherever the two children wandered, green buds burst forth on bush and tree, the grass grew higher, and the cornfields became lovely and delicate green. The little maiden strewed flowers in her path. She held her apron before her. It was full of flowers. It was as if they sprung into life there, for the more she scattered around her, the more flowers did her apron contain. Eagerly she showered snowy blossoms over apple and peach trees, so that they stood in full beauty before even their green leaves had burst from the bud. Then the boy and the girl clapped their hands, and troops of birds came flying by, no one knew from whence, and they all twittered and chirped, singing, "'Spring has come!' How beautiful everything was! Many an old dame came forth from her door into the sunshine, and shuffled about with great delight, glancing at the golden flowers which glittered everywhere in the fields, as they used to do in her young days. The world grew young again to her, as she said, It is a blessed time out here today. The forest already wore its dress of dark green buds. The thyme blossomed in fresh fragrance. Primroses and anemones sprung forth, and violets bloomed in the shade, while every blade of grass was full of strength and sap. Who could resist sitting down on such a beautiful carpet? And then the young children of spring seated themselves, holding each other's hands, and sang and laughed and grew. A gentle rain fell upon them from the sky, but they did not notice it, for the raindrops were their own tears of joy. They kissed each other and were betrothed, and in the same moment the buds of the trees unfolded, and when the sun rose the forest was green. Hand in hand the two wandered beneath the fresh pendant canopy of foliage, where the sun's rays gleamed through the opening of the shade in changing and varied colors. The delicate young leaves filled the air with refreshing odor. Merrily rippled the clear brooks and rivulets between the green, velvety rushes, and over the many-colored pebbles beneath. All nature spoke of abundance and plenty. The cuckoo sang, and the lark caroled, for it was now beautiful spring. The careful willows had, however, covered their blossoms with woolly gloves and this carefulness is rather tedious. Days and weeks went by, and the heat increased. Warm air waved the corn as it grew golden in the sun. The white northern lily spread its large green leaves over the glossy mirror of the woodland lake, and the fishes sought the shadows beneath them. In a sheltered part, 
of the wood the sun shone upon the walls of a farmhouse brightening the blooming roses and ripening the black juicy berries which hung on the loaded cherry trees with his hot beams here sat the lovely wife of summer the same whom we have seen as a child and a bride her eyes were fixed on dark gathering clouds which in wavy outlines of black and indigo were piling themselves up like mountains higher and higher they came from every side always increasing like a rising rolling sea then they swooped towards the forest where every sound had been silenced as if by magic every breath hushed every bird mute all nature stood still in grave suspense but in the lanes and the highways passengers on foot or in carriages were hurrying to find a place of shelter then came a flash of light as if the sun had rushed forth from the sky flaming burning all devouring and darkness returned amid a rolling crash of thunder the rain poured down in streams now there was darkness then blinding light now thrilling silence then deafening din the young brown reeds on the moor waved to and fro in feathery billows the forest boughs were hidden in a watery mist and still light and darkness followed each other still came the silence after the roar while the corn and the blades of grass lay beaten down and swamped so that it seemed impossible they could ever raise themselves again but after a while the rain began to fall gently the sun's rays pierced the clouds and the water drops glittered like pearls on leaf and stem the birds sang the fishes leapt up to the surface of the water the gnats danced in the sunshine and yonder on a rock by the heaving salt sea sat summer himself a strong man with sturdy limbs and long dripping hair strengthened by the cool bath he sat in the warm sunshine while all around him renewed nature bloomed strong luxuriant and beautiful it was summer warm lovely summer sweet and pleasant was the fragrance wafted from the clover field where the bees swarmed round the ruined tower the bramble twined itself over the old altar which washed by the rain glittered in the sunshine and thither flew the queen bee with her swarm and prepared wax and honey but summer and his bosom wife saw it with different eyes to them the altar table was covered with the offerings of nature the evening sky shone like gold no church dome could ever gleam so brightly and between the golden evening and the blushing morning there was moonlight it was indeed summer and days and weeks passed the bright skies of the reapers glittered in the cornfields the branches of the apple trees bent low heavy with the red and golden fruit the hop hanging in clusters filled the air with sweet fragrance and beneath the hazel bushes where the nuts hung in great bunches rested a man and a woman summer and his grave consort see she exclaimed what wealth what blessings surround us everything is homelike and good and yet i know not why i long for rest and peace i can scarcely express what i feel they are already ploughing the fields again more and more the people wish for gain see the storks are flocking together and following the plough at a short distance they are the birds from egypt who carried us through the air do you remember how we came as children to this land of the north we brought with us flowers and bright sunshine and green to the forests but the wind has been rough with them and they are now become dark and brown like the trees of the south but they do not like them bear golden fruit do you wish to see golden fruit said the man then rejoice and he lifted his arm the leaves of the forest put on colors of red and gold and bright tints covered the woodlands the rose bushes gleamed with scarlet hips and the branches of the elder trees hung down with the weight of the full dark berries the wild chestnuts fell ripe from their dark green shells and in the forests the violets bloomed for the second time but the queen of the year became more and more silent and pale it blows cold she said and night brings the damp mist i long for the land of my childhood then she saw the storks fly away every one and she stretched out her hands towards them she looked at the empty nests in one of them grew a long-stalked cornflower in another the yellow mustard seed 
as if the nest had been placed there only for its comfort and protection, and the sparrows were flying round them all. "'Tweet, where has the master of the nest gone?' cried one. "'I suppose he could not bear it when the wind blew, and therefore he has left this country. I wish him a pleasant journey.' The forest leaves became more and more yellow, leaf after leaf fell, and the stormy winds of autumn howled. The year was now far advanced, and upon the fallen yellow leaves lay the queen of the year, looking up with mild eyes at the gleaming star, and her husband stood by her. A gust of wind swept through the foliage, and the leaves fell in a shower. The summer queen was gone, but a butterfly, the last of the year, flew through the cold air. Damp fogs came, icy winds blew, and the long dark nights of winter approached. The ruler of the year appeared with hair white as snow, but he knew it not. He thought snowflakes falling from the sky covered his head, as they decked the green fields with a thin white covering of snow. And then the church bells rang out for Christmas time. The bells are ringing for the new-born year, said the ruler. Soon will a new ruler and his bride be born, and I shall go to rest with my wife in yonder life-giving star. In the fresh green fir-wood, where the snow lay all around, stood the angel of Christmas, and consecrated the young trees that were to adorn his feast. "'May there be joy in the rooms, and under the green boughs,' said the old ruler of the year. In a few weeks he had become a very old man, with hair as white as snow. My resting time draws near. The young pair of the year will soon claim my crown and scepter." But the night is still thine, said the angel of Christmas, for power, but not for rest. Let the snow lie warmly upon the tender seed. Learn to endure the thought that another is worshipped whilst thou art still Lord. Learn to endure being forgotten while yet thou livest. The hour of thy freedom will come when spring appears. And when will spring come? asked Winter. It will come when the stork returns. And with white locks and snowy beard, cold, bent, and hoary, but strong as the wintry storm, and firm as the ice, old winter sat on the snow-drift-covered hill, looking towards the south, where winter had sat before, and gazed. The ice glittered, the snow crackled, the skaters skimmed over the polished surface of the lakes. Ravens and crows formed a pleasing contrast to the white ground, and not a breath of wind stirred and in the still air old winter clenched his fists, and the ice lay fathoms deep between the lands. Then came the sparrows again out of the town, and asked, Who is that old man? The raven sat there still, or it might be his son, which is the same thing, and he said to them, It is winter, old man of the former year. He is not dead, as the calendar says, but he is guardian to the spring, which is coming. "'When will spring come?' asked the sparrows. "'For we shall have better times then, and a better rule. "'The old times are worth nothing.' "'And in quiet thought old winter looked at the leafless forest, "'where the graceful form and bends of each tree and branch could be seen, "'and while winter slept, icy mists came from the clouds, "'and the ruler dreamt of his youthful days and of his manhood, "'and in the morning dawn the whole forest glittered with hoar-frost, which the sun shook from the branches, and this was the summer dream of winter. "'When will spring come?' asked the sparrows. "'Spring!' Again the echo sounded from the hills on which the snow lay. The sunshine became warmer, the snow melted, and the birds twittered. "'Spring is coming!' And high in the air flew the first stork, and the second followed. A lovely child sat on the back of each, and they sank down on the open field kissed the earth, and kissed the quiet old man, and, as the mist from the mountain-top, he vanished away and disappeared, and the story of the year was finished. "'This is all very fine, no doubt,' said the sparrows, "'and it is very beautiful, but it is not according to the calendar, therefore it must be all wrong.'" End of The Story of the Year Recording by Samantha Miles
Section 17 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Delic, Dallas, Texas. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. There is no doubt about it. That was a terrible affair, said a hen, and in a quarter of the town, too, where it had not taken place. That was a terrible affair in a hen roost. I cannot sleep alone tonight. It is a good thing that many of us sit on the roost together. And then she told a story that made the feathers on the other hens bristle up and the cock's comb fall. There was no doubt about it. But we will begin at the beginning. And that is to be found in a hen roost in another part of the town. The sun was setting and the fowls were lying on to their roost. One hen with white feathers and short legs used to lay her eggs according to the regulations and was as a hen respectable in every way as she was flying upon the roost she plucked herself with her beak and a little feather came out there it goes she said the more i pluck the more beautiful do i get she said this merrily for she was the best of the hens and moreover as had been said very respectable with that she went to sleep it was dark all around, and hen sat close to hen, but the one who sat nearest to her merry neighbor did not sleep. She had heard, and yet not heard, as we are often obliged to do in this world, in order to live at peace, but she could not keep it from her neighbor on the other side any longer. Did you hear what was said? I mention no names, but there is a hen here who intends to pluck herself in order to look well. If I were a cock, I should despise her. Just over the fowl sat the owl, with Father Owl and the little owls. The family has sharp ears, and they all heard every word that their neighbor had said. They rolled their eyes, and Mother Owl, beating her wings, said, Don't listen to her but I suppose you heard what was said. I heard it with my own ears, and one has to hear a great deal before they fall off. There is one among the fowls who has so far forgotten what is becoming to a hen that she plucks out all her feathers and lets the cock see it. Prenez God all the fonts, said Father Owl. Children should not hear such things. But I must tell our neighbor Owl about it. She is such an estimable Owl to talk to. And with that she flew away. To whoo, to whoo. They both hooted into the neighbor's dove cot to the doves inside. Have you heard? Have you heard? To whoo. There is a hen who has plucked out all her feathers for the sake of the cock. She will freeze to death if she is not frozen already. To whoo. Where, where? cooed the doves. In the neighbor's yard. I have as good as seen it myself. It is almost unbecoming to tell the story, but there is no doubt about it. Believe every word of what we tell you, said the doves, and cooed down into their poultry yard. There is a hen, nay, some say that there are two, who have plucked out all their feathers in order not to look like the others and to attract the attention of the cock it is a dangerous game for one can easily catch cold and die from fever and both of these are dead already wake up wake up crowed the cock and flew upon his board sleep was still in his eyes but yet he crowed out three hens have died of their unfortunate love for a cock they had plucked out all their feathers it is a horrible story i will not keep it to myself but let it go farther let it go farther, shrieked the bats, and the hens clucked and the cocks crowed. Let it go farther, let it go farther. In this way the story traveled from poultry yard to poultry yard, and at last came back to the place from which it had really started. Five hens, it now ran, 
have plucked out all their feathers to show which of them had grown leanest for love of the cock and then they all pecked at each other till the blood ran down and they fell down dead to the derision and shame of their family and to the great loss of their owner the hen who had lost the loose little feather naturally did not recognize her own story and being a respectable hen said i despise these fowls but there are more of that kind such things ought not to be concealed and i will do my best to get the story into the papers so that it becomes known throughout the land the hens have richly deserved it and their family too it got into the papers it was printed and there is no doubt about it one little feather may easily grow into five hens End of There Is No Doubt About It. Recording by Candace Dalek, Dallas, Texas. Section 18 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. A Cheerful Temper. From my father I received the best inheritance, namely a good temper. And who was my father? That has nothing to do with the good temper, but I will say that he was lively, good looking, round, and fat. He was both in appearance and character a complete contradiction to his profession. And pray, what was his profession and his standing in respectable society? Well, perhaps if in the beginning of a book these were written and printed, many, when they read it, would lay the book down and say, It seems to me a very miserable title. I don't like things of this sort. And yet my father was not a skin-dresser or an executioner. On the contrary, his employment placed him at the head of the grandest people of the town, and it was his place by right. He had to precede the bishop, and even the princes of the blood. He always went first. He was a hearse-driver. There now the truth is out, and I will own that when people saw my father perched up in front of the omnibus of death, dressed in his long, wide, black cloak, and his black-edged, three-cornered hat on his head, and then glanced at his round, jocund face, round as the sun, they could not think much of sorrow or the grave. That face said, It is nothing, it will all end better than people think. So I have inherited from him not only my good temper, but a habit of going often to the churchyard, which is good when done in a proper humor. And then also I take in the intelligencer, just as he used to do. I am not very young, I have neither wife nor children, nor a library, but, as I said, I read the Intelligencer, which is enough for me. It is to me a delightful paper, and so it was to my father. It is of great use, for it contains all that a man requires to know, the names of the preachers at the church, and the new books which are published, where houses, servants, clothes, and provisions may be obtained." and then what a number of subscriptions to charities, and what innocent verses! Persons seeking interviews and engagements, all so plainly and naturally stated. Certainly a man who takes in the intelligencer may live merrily and be buried contentedly, and by the end of his life will have such a capital stock of paper that he can lie on a soft bed of it, unless he prefers wood shavings for his resting place. The newspaper and the churchyard were always exciting objects to me. My walks to the latter were like bathing places to my good humor. Every one can read the newspaper for himself, but come with me to the churchyard while the sun shines and the trees are green, and let us wander among the graves. Each of them is like a closed book, with the back uppermost, on which we can read the title of what the book contains, but nothing more. I had a great deal of information from my father, and I have noticed a great deal myself. I keep it in my diary, in which I write for my own use and pleasure, a history of all who lie here, and a few more beside. 
Now we are in the churchyard. Here, behind the white iron railings, once a rose tree grew. It is gone now, but a little bit of evergreen, from a neighboring grave, stretches out its green tendrils, and makes some appearance. There rests a very unhappy man, and yet while he lived he might be said to occupy a very good position. He had enough to live upon, and something to spare. But owing to his refined tastes, the least thing in the world annoyed him. If he went to a theatre of an evening, instead of enjoying himself, he would be quite annoyed if the machinist had put too strong a light into one side of the moon, or if the representations of the sky hung over the scenes when they ought to have hung behind them, or if a palm tree was introduced into a scene representing the zoological gardens of Berlin, or a cactus in a view of Tyrol, or a beech tree in the north of Norway, as if these things were of any consequence. Why did he not leave them alone? Who would trouble themselves about such trifles, especially at a comedy, where every one is expected to be amused? Then sometimes the public applauded too much, or too little, to please him. They are like wet wood, he would say, looking round to see what sort of people were present. This evening nothing fires them. Then he would vex and fret himself because they did not laugh at the right time, or because they laughed in the wrong places, so he fretted and worried himself until at last the unhappy man fretted himself into the grave. Here rests a happy man, that is to say, a man of high birth and position, which was very lucky for him, otherwise he would have been scarcely worth notice. It is beautiful to observe how wisely nature orders these things. He walked about in a coat embroidered all over, and in the drawing-rooms of society looked just like one of those rich pearl-embroidered bell-pulls, which are only made for show, and behind them always hangs a good thick cord for use. This man also had a stout, useful substitute behind him, who did duty for him, and performed all his dirty work. And there are still, even now, these serviceable cords behind other embroidered bell-robes. It is all so wisely arranged that a man may well be in a good humor. Here rests, ah, it makes one feel mournful to think of him, but here rests a man who, during sixty-seven years, was never remembered to have said a good thing. He lived only in the hope of having a good idea. At last he felt convinced in his own mind that he really had one, and was so delighted that he positively died of joy at the thought of having at last caught an idea. Nobody got anything by it. Indeed, no one ever heard what the good thing was. Now I can imagine that this same idea may prevent him from resting quietly in his grave. For suppose that to produce a good effect, it is necessary to bring out his new idea at breakfast, and that he can only make his appearance on earth at midnight, as ghosts are believed generally to do. Why, then, this good idea would not suit the hour, and the man would have to carry it down again with him into the grave. That must be a troubled grave. The woman who lies here was so remarkably stingy that during her life she would get up in the night and mew, that her neighbors might think she kept a cat. What a miser she was! Here rests a young lady of a good family, who would always make her voice heard in society, and when she sang, Mi manca la voce, footnote, I want a voice, or I have no voice, and footnote. It was the only true thing she ever said in her life. Here lies a maiden of another description. She was engaged to be married, but her story is one of everyday life. We will leave her to rest in the grave. Here rests a widow, who, with music in her tongue, carried gall in her heart. She used to go round among the families near, and search out their faults, upon which she prayed with all the envy and malice of her nature. This is a family grave. The members of this family held so firmly together in their opinions that they would believe in no other. If the newspapers, or even the whole world, said of a certain subject, it is so-and-so, and a little schoolboy declared he had learned quite differently, they would take his assertion as the only true one, because he belonged to the family. 
and it is well known that if the yard cock belonging to this family happened to crow at midnight, they would declare it was morning, although the watchmen and all the clocks in the town were proclaiming the hour of twelve at night. The great poet Goethe concludes his Faust with the words, may be continued. So might our wanderings in the churchyard be continued. I come here often, and if any of my friends, or those who are not my friends, are too much for me, I go out and choose a plot of ground in which to bury him or her. Then I bury them as it were. There they lie, dead and powerless, till they come back new and better characters. Their lives and their deeds, looked at after my own fashion, I write down in my diary, as every one ought to do. Then, if any of our friends act absurdly, no one need to be vexed about it. Let them bury the offenders out of sight, and keep their good temper. They can also read the Intelligencer, which is a paper written by the people, with their hands guided. When the time comes for the history of my life, to be bound by the grave, then they will write upon it as my epitaph, the man with a cheerful temper. And this is my story. End of section 18「Section 19 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. A Great Grief, 1853. His story really consists of two parts. The first part might be left out, but it gives us a few particulars, and these are useful. We were staying in the country at a gentleman's seat, where it happened that the master was absent for a few days. In the meantime there arrived from the next town a lady. She had a pug dog with her, and came, she said, to dispose of shares in her tan yard. She had her papers with her, and we advised her to put them in an envelope, and to write thereon the address of the proprietor of the estate, General War Commissary Knight, etc. She listened to us attentively, seized the pen, paused, and begged us to repeat the directions slowly. We complied, and she wrote, but in the midst of the general war she struck fast, sighed deeply, and said, I am only a woman. Her puggy had seated itself on the ground while she wrote, and growled, for the dog had come with her for amusement and for the sake of its health and then the bare floor ought not to be offered to a visitor. His outward appearance was characterized by a snub nose and a very fat back. "'He doesn't bite,' said the lady. "'He has no teeth. He is like one of the family, faithful and grumpy. But the latter is my grandchildren's fault, for they have teased him. They play at wedding, and want to give him the part of the bridesmaid, and that's too much for him, poor old fellow.' and she delivered her papers, and took Puggy upon her arm. And this is the first part of the story, which might have been left out. Puggy died. That's the second part. It was about a week afterwards we arrived in the town, and put up at the inn. Our windows looked into the tan-yard, which was divided into two parts by a partition of planks. In one half were many skins and hides, raw and tanned. Here was all the apparatus necessary to carry on a tannery, and it belonged to the widow. Puggy had died in the morning, and was to be buried in this part of the yard. The grandchildren of the widow, that is, of the tanner's widow, for Puggy had never been married, filled up the grave, and it was a beautiful grave. It must have been quite pleasant to lie there. The grave was bordered with pieces of flower-pots and strewn over with sand. Quite at the top they had stuck up half a beer-bottle, with the neck upwards, and that was not at all allegorical. The children danced round the grave, and the eldest of boys among them, a practical youngster of seven years, 
made the proposition that there should be an exhibition of Puggy's burial place for all who lived in the lane. The price of admission was to be a trouser button, for every boy would be sure to have one, and each might also give one for a little girl. This proposal was adopted by acclamation. And all the children out of the lane, yes, even out of the little lane at the back, flocked to the place, and each gave a button. Many were noticed to go about on that afternoon with only one suspender, but then they had seen Puggy's grave, and the sight was worth much more. But in front of the tan-yard, close to the entrance, stood a little girl clothed in rags, very pretty to look at, with curly hair, and eyes so blue and clear that it was a pleasure to look into them. The child said not a word, nor did she cry. But each time the little door was opened, she gave a long, long look into the yard. She had not a button. That she knew right well, and therefore she remained standing sorrowfully outside, till all the others had seen the grave and had gone away. Then she sat down, held her little brown hands before her eyes, and burst into tears. This girl alone had not seen Puggy's grave. It was a grief as great to her as any grown person can experience. We saw this from above, and looked at from above, how many a grief of our own and of others can make us smile. That is the story, and whoever does not understand it may go and purchase a share in the tan-yard from the window. End of a Great Grief Recording by Pamela Kranz Section 20 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848-1853, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul everything in the right place. It is more than a hundred years ago. At the border of the wood, near a large lake, stood an old mansion. Deep ditches surrounded it on every side, in which reeds and bulrushes grew. Close by the drawbridge, near the gate, there was an old willow tree, which bent over the reeds. From the narrow pass came the sound of bugles and the tramping of horses' feet. Therefore a little girl who was watching the geese hastened to drive them away from the bridge, before the whole hunting party came galloping up. They came, however, so quickly, that the girl, in order to avoid being run over, placed herself on one of the high corner stones of the bridge. She was still half a child, and very delicately built. She had bright blue eyes, and a gentle, sweet expression. But such things the baron did not notice. While he was riding past the little goose girl, he reversed his hunting crop, and in rough play gave her such a push with it that she fell backward into the ditch. "'Everything in the right place,' he cried, "'into the ditch with you.' Then he burst out laughing, for that he called fun. The others joined in, the whole party shouted and cried, while the hounds barked. While the poor girl was falling, she happily caught one of the branches of the willow tree, by the help of which she held herself over the water, and as soon as the baron with his company and the dogs had disappeared through the gate, the girl endeavoured to scramble up, but the branch broke off, and she would have fallen backward among the rushes, had not a strong hand from above seized her at this moment. It was the hand of a peddler. He had witnessed what had happened from a short distance, and now hastened to assist her. "'Everything in the right place.' he said, imitating the noble baron, and pulling the little maid up to the dry ground. He wished to put the branch back in the place it had been broken off, but it is not possible to put everything in the right place. Therefore he stuck the branch into the soft ground. "'Grow and thrive if you can, and produce a good flute for them yonder in the mansion,' he said. It would have given him a great pleasure to see the noble baron and his companions well thrashed. Then he entered the castle, but not the banqueting hall, he was too humble for that. No, he went to the servants' hall. The men's servants and maids looked over his stock of articles and bargained with him. 
loud crying and screaming were heard from the master's table above they called it singing indeed they did their best laughter and the howls of dogs were heard through the open windows there they were feasting and revelling wine and strong old ale were foaming in the glasses and jugs the favourite dogs ate with their masters now and then the squires kissed one of these animals after having wiped its mouth first with the tablecloth they ordered the peddler to come up but only to make fun of him the wine had got into their heads and reason had left them they poured beer into a stocking that he could drink with them but quick that's what they called fun and it made them laugh then meadows peasants and farmyards were staked on one card and lost everything in the right place the peddler said when he had at last safely got out of sodom and gomorrah as he called it the open high road is my right place up there i did not feel at ease the little maid who was still watching the geese nodded kindly to him as he passed through the gate days and weeks passed and it was seen that the broken willow branch which the peddler had stuck into the ground near the ditch remained fresh and green nay it even put forth fresh twigs the little goose girl saw that the branch had taken root and was very pleased the tree so she said was now her tree while the tree was advancing everything else at the castle was going backward through feasting and gambling for these are two rollers upon which nobody stands safely less than six years afterwards the baron passed out of his little castle gate a poor beggar while the baronial seat had been bought by a rich tradesman he was the very peddler they had made fun of and poured beer into a stocking for him to drink but honesty and industry bring one forward and now the peddler was the possessor of the baronial estate from that time forward no card-playing was permitted there that's a bad pastime he said when the devil saw the bible for the first time he wanted to produce a caricature in opposition to it and invented card-playing the new proprietor of the estate took a wife and whom did he take the little goose girl who had always remained good and kind and who looked as beautiful in her new clothes as if she had been a lady of high birth and how did all this come about that would be too long a tale to tell in our busy time but it really happened and the most important events have yet to be told it was pleasant and cheerful to live in the old place now the mother superintended the household and the father looked after things out of doors and they were indeed very prosperous where honesty leads the way prosperity is sure to follow the old mansion was repaired and painted, the ditches were cleaned and fruit trees planted. All was homely and pleasant, and the floors were as white and shining as a pasteboard. In the long winter evenings the mistress and her maids sat at the spinning wheel in the large hall. Every Sunday the counsellor, this title the peddler had obtained, although only in his old days, read aloud a portion from the Bible. The children, for they had children, all received the best education, but they were not all equally clever, as is the case in all families. In the meantime the willow tree near the drawbridge had grown up into a splendid tree, and stood there, free, and was never clipped. "'It is our genealogical tree,' said the old people to their children, "'and therefore it must be honoured. A hundred years had elapsed. It was in our own days, the lake had been transformed into marshland, the whole baronial seat had, as it were, disappeared. A pool of water near some ruined walls was the only reminder of the deep ditches, and here stood a magnificent old tree with overhanging branches. That was the genealogical tree. Here it stood and showed how beautiful a willow can look if one does not interfere with it. The trunk, it is true, was cleft in the middle from the root to the crown, the storms had bent it a little, but it still stood there, and out of every crevice and cleft, in which wind and weather had carried mould, blades of grass and flowers sprang forth. Especially above, where the large boughs parted, there was quite a hanging garden, in which wild raspberries and heart's tongue ferns throve, and even a little mistletoe had taken root, and grew gracefully in the old willow branches, 
which were reflected in the dark water beneath when the wind blew the chickweed into the corner of the pool. A footpath, which led across the fields, passed close by the old tree. High up, on the woody hillside, stood the new mansion. It had a splendid view, and was large and magnificent. Its window panes were so clear that one might have thought there were none there at all. The large flight of steps which led to the entrance looked like a bower covered with roses and broad-leaved plants. The lawn was as green as if each blade of grass was cleaned separately morning and evening. Inside, in the hall, valuable oil paintings were hanging on the walls. Here stood chairs and sofas covered with silk and velvet, which could be easily rolled out on casters. There were tables with polished marble tops, and books bound in Morocco with gilt edges. Indeed, well-to-do and distinguished people lived here. It was the dwelling of the baron and his family. Each article was in keeping with its surroundings. Everything in the right place was the motto according to which they also acted here, and therefore all the paintings which had once been the honor and glory of the old mansion were now hung up in the passage which led to the servants' rooms. It was all old lumber, especially two portraits, one representing a man in a scarlet coat with a wig, and the other a lady with powdered and curled hair holding a rose in her hand, each of them being surrounded by a large wreath of willow branches. Both portraits had many holes in them, because the baron's sons used the two old people as targets for their crossbows. They represented the counsellor and his wife, from whom the whole family descended but they did not properly belong to our family, said one of the boys. He was a peddler, and she kept the geese. They were not like Papa and Mama. The portraits were old lumber, and everything in its right place. That was why the great-grandparents had been hung up in the passage leading to the servants' rooms. The son of the village pastor was tutor at the mansion. One day he went for a walk across the fields with his young pupils and their elder sister, who had lately been confirmed. They walked along the road which passed by the old willow tree, and while they were on the road she picked a bunch of field flowers. Everything in the right place, and indeed the bunch looked very beautiful. At the same time she listened to all that was said, and she very much liked to hear the pastor's son speak about the elements and of the great men and women in history. She had a healthy mind, noble in thought and deed, and with a heart full of love for everything that God had created. They stopped at the old willow tree, as the youngest of the baron's sons wished very much to have a flute from it, such as had been cut for him from other willow trees. The pastor's son broke a branch off. "'Oh, pray do not do it,' said the young lady, but it was already done. "'This is our famous old tree. I love it very much.' They often laugh at me at home about it, but that does not matter. There is a story attached to this tree. And now she told him all that we already know about the tree, the old mansion, the peddler, and the goose girl who had met there for the first time, and had become the ancestors of the noble family to which the young lady belonged. They did not like to be knighted, the good old people, she said. Their motto was, everything in the right place and it would not be right, they thought, to purchase a title for money. My grandfather, the first baron, was their son. They say he was a very learned man, a great favorite with the princes and princesses, and was invited to all court festivities. The others at home love him best, but, I do not know why, there seemed to me to be something about the old couple that attracts my heart. How homely, how patriarchal, it must have been in the old mansion, where the mistress sat at the spinning-wheel with her maids, while her husband read aloud out of the Bible. "'They must have been excellent, sensible people,' said the pastor's son, and with this the conversation turned naturally to noblemen and commoners. From the manner in which the tutor spoke about the significance of being noble, it seemed almost as if he did not belong to a commoner's family. It is good fortune to be of a family who have distinguished themselves, and to possess, as it were, a spur in oneself to advance to all that is good. It is a splendid thing to belong to a noble family, whose name serves as a card of admission to the highest circles. Nobility is a distinction. 
it is a gold coin that bears the stamp of its own value it is the fallacy of the time and many poets express it to say all that is noble is bad and stupid and that on the contrary the lower one goes among the poor the more brilliant virtues one finds i do not share this opinion for it is wrong in the upper classes one sees many touchingly beautiful traits my own mother has told me of such and i could mention several one day she was visiting a nobleman's house in town my grandmother i believe had been the lady's nurse when she was a child my mother and the nobleman were alone in the room when he suddenly noticed an old woman on crutches come limping into the courtyard she came every saturday to carry a gift away with her there is the poor old woman said the nobleman it is so difficult for her to walk my mother had hardly understood what he said before he disappeared from the room and went downstairs in order to save her the troublesome walk for the gift she came to fetch of course this is only a little incident but it has its good sound like the poor widow's two mites in the bible the sound which echoes in the depth of every human heart and this is what the poet ought to show and point out more especially in our own time he ought to sing of this it does good it mitigates and reconciles but when a man simply because he is of noble birth and possesses a genealogy stands on his hind legs and neighs in the street like an arabian horse and says when a commoner has been in the room some people from the street have been here there nobility is decaying it has become a mask of the kind that thespis created and is amusing when such a person is exposed in satire such was the tutor's speech it was a little long but while he delivered it he had finished cutting the flute there was a large party at the mansion many guests from the neighborhood and from the capital had arrived there were ladies with tasteful and with tasteless dresses the big hall was quite crowded with people the clergymen stood humbly together in a corner and looked as if they were preparing for a funeral but it was a festival only the amusement had not yet begun a great concert was to take place and that is why the baron's young son had brought his willow flute with him but he could not make it sound nor could his father and therefore the flute was good for nothing there was music and songs of the kind which delight most those that perform them otherwise quite charming are you an artist said a cavalier the son of his father you play on the flute you have made it yourself it is genius that rules the place of honor is due to you certainly not i only advance with the time and that of course one can't help i hope you will delight us all with the little instrument will you not thus saying he handed to the tutor the flute which had been cut from the willow tree by the pool and then announced in a loud voice that the tutor wished to perform a solo on the flute they wished to tease him that was evident and therefore the tutor declined to play although he could do so very well they urged and requested him however so long that at last he took up the flute and placed it to his lips that was a marvellous flute its sound was as thrilling as the whistle of a steam engine in fact it was much stronger for it sounded and was heard in the yard in the garden in the wood and many miles round in the country at the same time a storm rose and roared everything in the right place and with this the baron as if carried by the wind flew out of the hall straight into the shepherd's cottage and the shepherd flew not into the hall thither he could not come but into the servants hall among the smart footmen who were striding about in silk stockings these haughty menials looked horror-struck that such a person ventured to sit at table with them but in the hall the baron's daughter flew to the place of honor at the end of the table she was worthy to sit there the pastor's son had the seat next to her the two sat there as if they were a bridal pair an old count belonging to one of the oldest families of the country remained untouched in his place of honor the flute was just and it is one's duty to be so the sharp-tongued cavalier who had caused the flute to be played and who was the child of his parents flew headlong into the fowl house but not he alone the flute was heard at the distance of a mile and strange events took place 
a rich banker's family, who were driving in a coach and four, were blown out of it, and could not even find room behind it with their footmen. Two rich farmers who had in our days shot up higher than their own cornfields, were flung into the ditch. It was a dangerous flute. Fortunately it burst at the first sound, and that was a good thing, for then it was put back into its owner's pocket, its right place. The next day nobody spoke a word about what had taken place, thus originated the phrase, to pocket the flute. Everything was again in its usual order, except that the two old pictures of the peddler and the goose girl were hanging in the banqueting hall. There they were on the wall as if blown up there, and as a real expert said that they were painted by a master's hand, they remained there and were restored. Everything in its right place, and to this it will come. Eternity is long, much longer indeed than this story. End of section 20section 21 of hans christian anderson fairy tales and short stories volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by carol de rose hans christian anderson fairy tales and short stories volume 3 1848 to 1853 by hans christian anderson Translated by H. P. Paul The Goblin and the Huckster There was once a regular student who lived in a garret and had no possessions, and there was also a regular huckster to whom the house belonged and who occupied the ground floor. A goblin lived with the huckster because at Christmas he always had a large dish full of jam with a great piece of butter in the middle. The huckster could afford this and therefore the goblin remained with the huckster, which was very cunning of him. One evening the student came into the shop through the back door to buy candles and cheese for himself. He had no one to send, and therefore he came himself. He obtained what he wished, and then the huckster and his wife nodded good evening to him, and she was a woman who could do more than merely nod, for she had usually plenty to say for herself. The student nodded in return as he turned to leave, then suddenly stopped, and began reading the piece of paper in which the cheese was wrapped. It was a leaf torn out of an old book, a book that ought not to have been torn up, for it was full of poetry. "'Yonder lies more of the same sort,' said the huckster. "'I gave an old woman a few coffee berries for it. You shall have the rest for sixpence, if you will.' "'Indeed I will,' said the student. "'Give me the book instead of the cheese.' I can eat my bread and butter without cheese. It would be a sin to tear up a book like this. You are a clever man and a practical man, but you understand no more about poetry than that cask yonder. This was a very rude speech, especially against the cask, but the huckster and the student both laughed, for it was only said in fun. But the goblin felt very angry that any man should venture to say such things to a huckster who was a householder and sold the best butter. As soon as it was night and the shop closed and everyone in bed except the student, the goblin stepped softly into the bedroom where the huckster's wife slept and took away her tongue, which, of course, she did not then want. Whatever object in the room he placed the tongue upon immediately received voice and speech, and was able to express its thoughts and feelings as readily as the lady herself could do. It could only be used by one object at a time, which was a good thing, as a number speaking at once would have caused great confusion. The goblin laid the tongue upon the cask, in which lay a quantity of old newspapers. "'Is it really true,' he asked, "'that you do not know what poetry is?' "'Of course I know,' replied the cask. Poetry is something that always stand in the corner of a newspaper, and is sometimes cut out, and I may venture to affirm that I have more of it in me than the student has, and I am only a poor tub of the hucksters. Then the goblin placed the tongue on the coffee mill, and how it did go, to be sure. Then he put it on the butter tub and the cash box, and they all expressed the same opinion as the waste paper tub and a majority must always be respected. 
Now I shall go and tell the student, said the goblin. And with these words, he went quietly up the back stairs to the garret where the student lived. He had a candle burning still, and the goblin peeped through the keyhole and saw that he was reading in the torn book which he had brought out of the shop. But how light the room was! From the book shot forth a ray of light, which grew broad and full like the stem of a tree, from which bright rays spread upward and over the student's head. Each leaf was fresh, and each flower was like a beautiful female head, some with dark and sparkling eyes, and others with eyes that were wonderfully blue and clear. The fruit gleamed like stars, and the room was filled with sounds of beautiful music. The little goblin had never imagined, much less seen or heard of, any sight so glorious as this. He stood still on tiptoe, peeping in, till the light went out in the garret. The student, no doubt, had blown out his candle and gone to bed. But the little goblin remained standing there nevertheless, and listening to the music which still sounded on, soft and beautiful, a sweet cradle song for the student who had lain down to rest. This is a wonderful place, said the goblin. I never expected such a thing. I should like to stay here with the student. And the little man thought it over, for he was a sensible little spirit. At last he sighed. But the student has no jam. So he went downstairs again into the huckster's shop, and it was a good thing he got back when he did, for the cask had almost worn out the lady's tongue. He had given a description of all that he contained on one side, and was just about to turn himself over to the other side to describe what was there, when the goblin entered and restored the tongue to the lady. But from that time forward, the whole shop, from the cash box down to the pine wood logs, formed their opinions from that of the cask, and they all had such confidence in him, and treated him with so much respect that when the huckster read the criticisms on theatricals and art of an evening, they fancied it must all come from the cask. But after what he had seen, the goblin could no longer sit and listen quietly to the wisdom and understanding downstairs. So, as soon as the evening light glimmered in the garret, he took courage, for it seemed to him as if the rays of light were strong cables drawing him up and obliging him to go and peep through the keyhole. And while there, a feeling of vastness came over him, such as we experience by the ever-moving sea when the storm breaks forth, and it brought tears into his eyes. He did not himself know why he wept, yet a kind of pleasant feeling mingled with his tears. How wonderfully glorious it would be to sit with the student under such a tree! But that was out of the question. He must be content to look through the keyhole and be thankful for even that. There he stood on the old landing with the autumn wind blowing down upon him through the trap door. It was very cold, but the little creature did not really feel it till the light in the garret went out and the tones of music died away. Then how he shivered and crept downstairs again to his warm corner where it felt homelike and comfortable. And when Christmas came again, and brought the dish of jam and the great lump of butter, he liked the huckster best of all. Soon after, in the middle of the night, the goblin was awoke by a terrible noise and knocking against the window shutters and the house doors, and by the sound of the watchman's horn. For a great fire had broken out, and the whole street appeared full of flames. Was it in their house, or a neighbor's? No one could tell, for terror had seized upon all. The huckster's wife was so bewildered that she took her gold earrings out of her ears and put them in her pocket, that she might save something at least. The huckster ran to get his business papers, and the servant resolved to save her blue silk mantle, which she had managed to buy. Each wished to keep the best things they had. The goblin had the same wish, for with one spring he was upstairs and in the student's room, whom he found standing by the open window and looking quite calmly at the fire, which was raging at the house of a neighbor opposite. The goblin caught up the wonderful book which lay on the table and popped it into his red cap, which he held tightly with both hands. 
the greatest treasure in the house was saved, and he ran away with it to the roof and seated himself on the chimney. The flames of the burning house opposite illuminated him as he sat, both hands pressed tightly over his cap in which the treasure lay, and then he found out what feelings really reigned in his heart, and knew exactly which way they tended. And yet, when the fire was extinguished, and the goblin again began to reflect, he hesitated, and said at last, I must divide myself between the two. I cannot quite give up the huckster because of the jam. And this is a representation of human nature. We are like the goblin. We all go to visit the huckster because of the jam. End of The Goblin and the Huckster Recording by Carol DeRose Section 22 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. B. Paul. Under the Willow Tree The region round the little town of Kuye is very bleak and cold. The town lies on the seashore, which is always beautiful, but here it might be more beautiful than it is, for on every side the fields are flat, and it is a long way to the forest. But when persons reside in a place and get used to it, they can always find something beautiful in it, something for which they long, even in the most charming spot in the world which is not home. It must be owned that there are in the outskirts of the town some humble gardens on the banks of a little stream that runs on towards the sea, and in summer these gardens look very pretty. Such indeed was the opinion of two little children, whose parents were neighbours and who played in these gardens and forced their way from one garden to the other through the gooseberry bushes that divided them. In one of the gardens grew an elder tree, and in the other an old willow, under which the children were very fond of playing. They had permission to do so, although the tree stood close by the stream and they might easily have fallen into the water. But the eye of God watches over the little ones, otherwise they would never be safe. At the same time, these children were very careful not to go too near the water. Indeed, the boy was so afraid of it, that in the summer, while the other children were splashing about in the sea, nothing could entice him to join them. They jeered and laughed at him, and he was obliged to bear it all, as patiently as he could. Once the neighbor's little girl, Joanna, dreamed that she was sailing in a boat, and the boy, Knud was his name, waded out in the water to join her, and the water came up to his neck, and at last closed over his head, and in a moment he had disappeared. When little Knud heard this dream, it seemed as if he could not bear the moking and jeering again. How could he dare to go into the water now, after Joanna's dream? He never would do it, for this dream always satisfied him. The parents of these children, who were poor, often sat together while Knud and Joanna played in the gardens or in the road. Along this road, a row of willow trees had been planted to separate it from a ditch on one side of it. They were not very handsome trees, for the tops had been cut off. However, they were intended for use and not for show. The old willow tree in the garden was much handsomer, and therefore the children were very fond of sitting under it. The town had a large market-place, and at the fair time there would be whole rows like streets of tents and booths containing silks and ribbons and toys and cakes and everything that could be wished for. There were crowds of people, and sometimes the weather would be rainy and splash with moisture the woolen jackets of the peasants, but it did not destroy the beautiful fragrance of the honey cakes and gingerbread with which one booth was filled, and the best of it was that the man who sold these cakes always lodged during the fair time with little Knut's parents. So every now and then he had a present of gingerbread, and of course Joanna always had a share. And more delightful still, the gingerbread seller 
knew all sorts of things to tell, and could even relate stories about his own gingerbread. So one evening he told them a story that made such a deep impression on the children that they never forgot it, and therefore I think we may as well hear it too, for it is not very long. Once upon a time, said he, there lay on my counter two gingerbread cakes, one in the shape of a man wearing a hat, the other of a maiden without a bonnet. Their faces were on the side that was uppermost, for on the other side they looked very different. Most people have a best side to their characters, which they take care to show to the world. On the left, just where the heart is, the gingerbread man had an almond stuck in to represent it. But the maiden was honey cake all over. They were placed on the counter as samples, and after lying there a long time, they at last fell in love with each other. But neither of them spoke of it to the other, as they should have done if they expected anything to follow. He is a man. He ought to speak the first word, thought the gingerbread maiden, but she felt quite happy. She was sure that her love was returned, but his thoughts were far more ambitious, as the thoughts of a man often are. He dreamed that he was a real street boy, and that he possessed four real pennies, and that he had bought the gingerbread lady and ate her up, and so they lay on the counter for days and weeks, till they grew hard and dry. But the thoughts of the maiden became even more tender and womanly. Oh, well, it is enough for me that I have been able to live on the same counter with him, said she one day, when suddenly, crack, and she broke in two. Ah, said the gingerbread man to himself, if she had only known of my love, she would have kept together a little longer. And here they both are, and that is their history, said the cake man. You think the history of their lives and their silent love which never came to anything very remarkable, and there they are for you. So saying, he gave Joanna the gingerbread man who was still quite whole, and to Knut the broken maiden. But the children had been so much impressed by the story that they had not the heart to eat the lovers up. The next day they went into the churchyard and took the two cake figures with them, and sat down under the church wall, which was covered with luxuriant ivy in summer and winter, and looked as if hung with rich tapestry. They stuck up the two gingerbread figures in the sunshine among the green leaves, and they told the story and all about the silent love which came to nothing to a group of children. They called it love because the story was so lovely, and the other children had the same opinion. But when they turned to look at the gingerbread pear, the broken maiden was gone. A great boy out of wickedness had eaten her up. At first the children cried about it, but afterwards, thinking very probably that the poor lover ought not to be left alone in the world, they ate him up too. But they never forgot the story. The two children still continued to play together by the elder tree and under the willow, and the little maiden sang beautiful songs, with a voice that was as clear as a bell. Knud, on the contrary, had not a note of music in him, but knew the words of the songs, and that, of course, is something. The people of Kuya, and even the rich wife of the man who kept the fancy shop, would stand and listen while Joanna was singing, and say, She has really a very sweet voice. Those were happy days, but they could not last forever. The neighbors were separated. The mother of the little girl was dead, and her father had thoughts of marrying again, and of residing in the capital, where he had been promised a very lucrative appointment as messenger. The neighbors parted with tears, the children wept sadly, but their parents promised that they should write to each other at least once a year. After this Knud was bound apprentice to a shoemaker, he was growing a great boy, and could not be allowed to run wild any longer. Besides, he was going to be confirmed. Ah, how happy he would have been on that festal day in Copenhagen with little Joanna! But he still remained at Kuye, and had never seen the great city, though the town is not five miles from it. But far across the bay, when the sky was clear, the towers of Copenhagen could be seen, and on the day of his confirmation he saw distinctly the golden cross on the principal church glittering in the sun. How often his thoughts were with Joanna! But did she think of him? Yes, 
About Christmas came a letter from her father to Knut's parents, which stated that they were going on very well in Copenhagen, and mentioning particularly that Joanna's beautiful voice was likely to bring her a brilliant fortune in the future. She was engaged to sing at a concert, and she had already earned money by singing, out of which she sent her dear neighbors at Kuya a whole dollar, for them to make merry on Christmas Eve, and they were to drink her health. She had herself added this in a postscript, and in the same postscript she wrote, Kind regards to Knud. The good neighbors wept, although the news was so pleasant. But they wept tears of joy. Knud's thoughts had been daily with Joanna, and now he knew that she also had thought of him and the nearer the time came for his apprenticeship to end, the clearer did it appear to him that he loved Joanna, and that she must be his wife, and a smile came on his lips at the thought, and at one time he drew the thread so fast as he worked, and pressed his foot so hard against the knee-strap, that he ran the oil into his finger. But what did he care for that? He was determined not to play the dumb lover as both the gingerbread cakes had done. The story was a good lesson to him. At length he became a journeyman, and then, for the first time, he prepared for a journey to Copenhagen, with his knapsack packed and ready. A master was expecting him there, and he thought of Joanna and how glad she would be to see him. She was now seventeen, and he nineteen years old. He wanted to buy a gold ring for her in Kuya, but then he recollected how far more beautiful such things would be in Copenhagen. So he took leave of his parents, and on a rainy day, late in the autumn, wandered forth on food from the town of his birth. The leaves were falling from the trees, and by the time he arrived at his new master's in the great metropolis, he was wet through. On the following Sunday he intended to pay his first visit to Joanna's father. When the day came, the new journeyman's clothes were brought out, and a new hat which he had brought in Kuya. The hat became him very well, for hitherto he had only worn a cap. He found the house that he sought easily but had to mount so many stairs that he became quite giddy. It surprised him to find how people lived over one another in this dreadful town. On entering a room in which everything denoted prosperity, Joanna's father received him very kindly. The new wife was a stranger to him, but she shook hands with him and offered him coffee. "'Joanna will be very glad to see you,' said her father. "'You have grown quite a nice young man.' You shall see her presently. She is a good child, and is the joy of my heart, and, please God, she will continue to be so. She has her own room now, and pays us rent for it, and the father knocked quite politely at the door, as if he were a stranger, and then they both went in. How pretty everything was in that room! A more beautiful apartment could not be found in the whole town of Kuyu. The queen herself could scarcely be better accommodated. There were carpets and rugs and window curtains hanging to the ground. Pictures and flowers were scattered about. There was a velvet chair and a looking-glass against the wall, into which a person might be in danger of stepping, for it was as large as a door. All this Knut saw at a glance, and yet in truth he saw nothing but Joanna. She was quite grown up and very different from what Knut had fancied her, and a great deal more beautiful. In all Kuya there was not a girl like her, and how graceful she looked, although her glance at first was odd and not familiar but for a moment only. Then she rushed towards him as if she would have kissed him. She did not, however, although she was very near it. Yes, she really was joyful at seeing the friend of her childhood once more, and the tears even stood in her eyes. Then she asked so many questions about Knut's parents and everything, even to the elder tree in the willow, which she called Elder Mother and Willow Father, as if they had been human beings, and so indeed they might be quite as much as the gingerbread cakes. Then she talked about them, and the story of their silent love, and how they lay on the counter together and split in two. And then she laughed heartily, but the blood rushed into Knut's cheeks, and his heart beat quickly. Joanna was not proud at all. He noticed that through her he was invited by her parents to remain the whole evening with them, and she poured out the tea and gave him a cup herself, and afterwards she took a book and read aloud to them, and it seemed to Knut as if the story was all about himself and his love, for it agreed so well with his own thoughts, and then she sang a simple song, which, through her singing, became a true story, and as if she poured forth the feelings of her own heart. Oh, he thought, she knows I am fond of her. The tears he could not restrain rolled down his cheeks, and he was unable to utter a single word. It seemed as if he had been struck dumb. When he left, she pressed his hand and said, You have a kind heart, Knud. 
remain always as you are now. What an evening of happiness this had been! To sleep after it was impossible, and Knut did not sleep. At parting, Joanna's father had said, Now you won't quite forget us. You must not let the whole winter go by without paying us another visit. So that Knut felt himself free to go again the following Sunday evening, and so he did. But every evening after walking hours, and they walked by candlelight then, he walked out into the town and through the street in which Joanna lived to look up at her window. It was almost always lighted up, and one evening he saw the shadow of her face quite plainly on the window blind. That was a glorious evening for him. His master's wife did not like his always going out in the evening idling, wasting time, as she called it, and she shook her head. But his master only smiled and said, "'He is a young man, my dear, you know.' "'On Sunday I shall see her,' said Knut to himself, "'and I will tell her that I love her with my whole heart and soul, "'and that she must be my little wife. "'I know I am now only a poor journeyman shoemaker, "'but I will work and strive and become a master in time. "'Yes, I will speak to her. "'Nothing comes from silent love. "'I learned that from the gingerbread cake story.' "'Sunday came, but when Knut arrived, "'they were all unfortunately invited out to spend the evening, "'and were obliged to tell him so. "'Joanna pressed his hand and said, "'Have you ever been to the theatre? "'You must go once. "'I sing there on Wednesday. "'And if you have time on that day, I will send you a ticket. "'My father knows where your master lives.' "'How kind this was of her! "'And on Wednesday, about noon, "'Knut received a sealed packet with no address.' but the ticket was inside, and in the evening Knut went, for the first time in his life, to a theatre. And what did he see? He saw Joanna, and how beautiful and charming she looked. He certainly saw her being married to a stranger, but that was all in the play, and only a pretense. Knut well knew that. She could never have the heart, he thought, to send him a ticket to go and see it, if it had been real. So he looked on, and when all the people applauded and clapped their hands, he shouted hooray. He could see that even the king smiled at Joanna, and seemed delighted with her singing. How small Knud felt, but then he loved her so dearly, and thought she loved him, and the man must speak the first word, as the gingerbread maiden had thought. Ah, how much there was for him in that childish story. As soon as Sunday arrived, he went again, and felt as if he were about to enter on holy ground. Joanna was alone to welcome him. Nothing could be more fortunate. "'I am so glad you are come,' she said. "'I was thinking of sending my father for you, but I had a presentiment that you would be here this evening. The fact is, I wanted to tell you that I am going to France. I shall start on Friday. It is necessary for me to go there if I wish to become a first-rate performer.' Poor Knud! It seemed to him as if the whole room was whirling round with him. His courage failed, and he felt as if his heart would burst. He kept down the tears, but it was easy to see how sorrowful he was. "'You honest, faithful soul!' she exclaimed, and the words loosened Knut's tongue, and he told her how truly he had loved her, and that she must be his wife. And as he said this, he saw Joanna change colour, and turn pale. She let his hand fall, and said earnestly and mournfully, "'Knud, do not make yourself and me unhappy.' I will always be a good sister to you, one in whom you can trust, but I can never be anything more. And she drew her white hand over his burning forehead, and said, God gives strength to bear a great deal, if we only strive ourselves to endure. At this moment her stepmother came into the room, and Joanna said quickly, Knud is so unhappy because I am going away. And it appeared as if they had only been talking of her journey. Come, be a man she added, placing her hand on his shoulder. You are still a child, and you must be good and reasonable, as you were when we were both children and played together under the willow tree. Knut listened, but he felt as if the world had slid out of its course. His thoughts were like a loose thread, fluttering to and fro in the wind. He stayed, although he could not tell whether she had asked him to do so. But she was kind and gentle to him. She poured out his tea and sang to him. But the song had not the old tone in it, although it was wonderfully beautiful, and made his heart feel ready to burst, and then he rose to go. He did not offer his hand, but she seized it, and said, 
"'Will you not shake hands with your sister at parting, my old playfellow?' And she smiled through the tears that were rolling down her cheeks. Again she repeated the word brother, which was a great consolation, certainly, and thus they parted. She sailed to France, and Knud wandered about the muddy streets of Copenhagen. The other journeyman in the shop asked him why he looked so gloomy, and wanted him to go and amuse himself with them, as he was still a young man. So he went with them to a dancing-room. He saw many handsome girls there, but none like Joanna, and here, where he thought to forget her, she was more life-like before his mind than ever. "'God gives us strength to bear much if we try to do our best,' she had said, and as he thought of this, a devout feeling came into his mind, and he folded his hands. Then, as the violins played and the girls danced round the room, he started, for it seemed to him as if he were in a place where he ought not to have brought Joanna, for she was here with him in his heart, and so he went out at once. As he went through the streets at a quick pace, he passed the house where she used to live. It was all dark, empty, and lonely, but the world went on its course, and Knud was obliged to go on, too. Winter came, the water was frozen, and everything seemed buried in a cold grave. But when spring returned, and the first steamer prepared to sail, Knud was seized with a longing to wander forth into the world, but not to France. So he packed his knapsack and travelled through Germany, going from town to town, but finding neither rest or peace. It was not till he arrived at the glorious old town of Nuremberg that he gained the mastery over himself, and rested his weary feet, and here he remained. Nuremberg is a wonderful old city, and looks as if it had been cut out of an old picture-book. The streets seemed to have arranged themselves according to their own fancy, and as if the houses objected to stand in rows or rank and file. Gables with little towers, ornamented columns and statues, can be seen even to the city gate, and from the singular-shaped roofs, water sprouts, formed like dragons, or long lean dogs, extend far across to the middle of the street. Here, in the market-place, stood Knud, with his knapsack on his back, close to one of the old fountains which are so beautifully adorned with figures, scriptural and historical, and which spring up between the sparkling jets of water. A pretty servant-maid was just filling her pails, and she gave Knud a refreshing draught. She had a handful of roses, and she gave him one, which appeared to him like a good omen for the future. From a neighbouring church came the sounds of music, and the familiar tones reminded him of the organ at home at Kuye. So he passed into the great cathedral. The sunshine streamed through the painted glass windows, and between two lofty slender pillars. His thoughts became prayerful, and calm peace rested on his soul. He next sought and found a good master in Nuremberg, with whom he stayed and learned the German language. The old moat around the town had been converted into a number of little kitchen gardens, but the high walls with their heavy-looking towers are still standing. Inside these walls the rope-maker twisted his ropes along a walk built like a gallery, and in the cracks and crevices of the walls elder bushes grow and stretch their green boughs over the small houses which stand below. In one of these houses lived the master for whom Knut walked, and over the little garret window where he sat, the elder tree waved its branches. Here he dwelt through one summer and winter, but when spring came again, he could endure it no longer. The elder was in blossom, and its fragrance was so home-like that he fancied himself back again in the gardens of Kuye. So Knut left his master and went to walk for another, who lived further in the town, where no elder grew. His workshop was quite close to one of the old stone bridges near to a water-mill, round which the roaring stream rushed and foamed always, yet restrained by the neighbouring houses, whose old, decayed balconies hang over, and seemed ready to fall into the water. Here grew no elder, here was not even a flower-pot, with its little green plant. But just opposite the workshop stood a great willow-tree, which seemed to hold fast to the house for fear of being carried away by the water. It stretched its branches over the stream just as those of the willow tree in the garden of Kuye had spread over the river. Yes, he had indeed gone from elder mother to willow father. There was something about the tree here, especially in the moonlit nights, that went direct to his heart. Yet it was not in reality the moonlight, but the old tree itself. However, he could not endure it, and why? Ask the willow. Ask the blossoming elder. 
At all events, he bade farewell to Nuremberg, and journeyed onwards. He never spoke of Joanna to anyone. His sorrow was hidden in his heart. The old childish story of the two cakes had a deep meaning for him. He understood now why the gingerbread man had a bitter almond in his left side. His was the feeling of bitterness, and Joanna, so mild and friendly, was represented by the honey-cake maiden. As he thought upon all this, the strap of his knapsack pressed across his chest so that he could hardly breathe. He loosened it, but gained no relief. He saw but half the world around him, the other half he carried with him in his inward thoughts, and this is the condition in which he left Nuremberg. Not till he caught sight of the lofty mountains did the world appear more free to him. His thoughts were attracted to outer objects, and tears came into his eyes. The Alps appeared to him like the wings of earth folded together. Unfolded they would display the variegated pictures of dark woods, foaming waters, spreading clouds and masses of snow. At the last day, thought he, the earth will unfold its great wings and soar upwards to the skies, there to burst like a soap bubble in the radiant glance of the deity. Oh, sighed he, that the last day were come. Silently he wandered on through the country of the Alps, which seemed to him like a fruit garden covered with soft turf. From the wooden balconies of the houses the young lace-makers nodded as he passed. The summits of the mountains glowed in the red evening sunset, and the green lakes beneath the dark trees reflected the glow. Then he thought of the sea-coast by the bay Coye, with a longing in his heart that was, however, without pain. There, where the Rhine rolls onward like a great billow, and dissolves itself into snowflakes, where glistening clouds are ever changing as if here was the place of their creation, while the rainbow flutters about them like a many-coloured ribbon, there did Knut think of the water millet Coye with its rushing, foaming waters. Gladly would he have remained in the quiet Rhenish town, but there were too many elders and willow trees. So he travelled onwards, over a grand lofty chain of mountains, over ragged rocky precipices, and along roads that hung on the mountain side like a swallow's nest. The waters foamed in the depths below him, the clouds lay beneath him. He wandered on, treading upon alpine roses, thistles, and snow, with the summer sun shining upon him till at length he bid farewell to the lands of the north. Then he passed on under the shade of blooming chestnut trees, through vineyards and fields of Indian corn, till conscious that the mountains were as a wall between him and his early recollections, and he wished it to be so. Before him lay a large and splendid city called Milan, and here he found a German master who engaged him as a workman. The master and his wife, in whose workshop he was employed, were an old pious couple, and the two old people became quite fond of the quiet journeyman, who spoke but little, but walked more and led a pious Christian life, and even to himself it seemed as if God had removed the heavy burden from his heart. His greatest pleasure was to climb now and then to the roof of the noble church, which was built of white marble, the pointed towers, the decorated and open cloisters, the stately columns, the white statues which smiled upon him from every corner and porch and ark, all, even the church itself, seemed to him to have been formed from the snow of his native land. Above him was the blue sky, below him the city and the wide-spreading plains of Lombardy, and towards the north the lofty mountains covered with perpetual snow. And then he thought of the church of Coye, with its red ivy-clad walls, but he had no longing to go there. Here, beyond the mountains, he would die and be buried. Three years had passed away since he left his home. One year of that time he had dwelt at Milan. One day his master took him into the town, not to the circus in which riders performed, but to the opera, a large building, itself a sight well worth seeing. The seven tiers of boxes, which reached from the ground to a dizzy height, near the ceiling, were hung with rich silken curtains, and in them were seated elegantly dressed ladies, with bouquets of flowers in their hands. The gentlemen were also in full dress, and many of them wore decorations of gold and silver. The place was so brilliantly lighted that it seemed like sunshine. And glorious music rolled through the building. Everything looked more beautiful than in the theatre at Copenhagen. But then Joanna had been there, and— Could it be? Yes, it was like magic. She was here also. 
for when the curtain rose there stood joanna dressed in silk and gold and with a golden crown upon her head she sang he thought as only an angel could sing and then she stepped forward to the front and smiled as only joanna could smile and looked directly at knud poor knud he seized his master's hand and cried out loud joanna but no one heard him excepting his master for the music sounded above everything yes yes it is joanna said his master and he drew forth a printed bill and pointed to her name which was there in full then it was not a dream all the audience applauded her and threw wreaths of flowers at her and every time she went away they called for her again so that she was always coming and going in the street the people crowded around her carriage and drew it away themselves without the horses knud was in the foremost row and shouted as joyously as the rest and when the carriage stopped before a brilliantly lighted house knud placed himself close to the door of her carriage it flew open and she stepped out the light fell upon her dear face and he could see that she smiled as she thanked them and appeared quite overcome knud looked straight in her face and she looked at him but she did not recognize him a man with a glittering star on his breast gave her his arm and people said the two were engaged to be married then knud went home and packed up his knapsack he felt he must return to the home of his childhood to the elder tree and the willow ah under that willow tree a man may live a whole life in one single hour the old couple begged him to remain but words were useless in vain they reminded him that winter was coming and that the snow had already fallen on the mountains he said he could easily follow the track of the closely moving carriages for which a path must be kept clear and with nothing but his knapsack on his back and leaning on his stick he could step along briskly so he turned his steps to the mountains ascended one side and descended the other still going northward till his strength began to fail and not a house or village could be seen the stars shone in the sky above him and down in the valley lights glittered like stars as if another sky were beneath him but his head was dizzy and his feet stumbled and he felt ill the lights in the valley grew brighter and brighter and more numerous and he could see them moving to and fro and then he understood that there must be a village in the distance so he exerted his failing strength to reach it and at length obtained shelter in a humble lodging he remained there that night and the whole of the following day for his body required rest and refreshment and in the valley there was rain and a thaw but early in the morning of the third day a man came with an organ and played one of the melodies of home and after that knut could remain there no longer so he started again on his journey toward the north he travelled for many days with hasty steps as if he were trying to reach home before all whom he remembered should die but he spoke to no one of his longing no one would have believed or understood this sorrow of his heart the deepest that can be felt by human nature such grief is not for the world it is not entertaining even to friends and poor knud had no friends he was a stranger wandering through strange lands to his home in the north he was walking one evening through the public roads the country around him was flatter with fields and meadows the air had a frosty feeling a willow tree grew by the roadside everything reminded him of home he felt very tired so he sat down under the tree and very soon began to nod then his eyes closed in sleep yet still he seemed conscious that the willow tree was stretching its branches over him in his dreaming state the tree appeared like a strong old man the willow father himself who had taken his tired son up in his arms to carry him back to the land of home to the garden of his childhood on the bleak open shores of koye and then he dreamt that it was really the willow tree itself from koye which had travelled out in the world to seek him and now had found him and carried him back into the little garden of the banks of the streamlet and there stood joanna in all her splendour with a golden crown on her head as he had last seen her to welcome him back and then there appeared before him two remarkable shapes which looked much more like human beings than when he had seen them in his childhood they were changed but he remembered that they were the two gingerbread cakes the man and the woman who had shown their best sides of the world and looked so good we thank you they said to knud for you have loosened our tongues we have learned from you that thoughts should be spoken freely or nothing will come of them and now something has come of our thoughts 
for we are engaged to be married. Then they walked away hand in hand through the streets of Kuye, looking very respectable on the best side, which they were quite right to show. They turned their steps to the church, and Knut and Joanna followed them, also walking hand in hand. There stood the church, as of old, with its red walls, on which the green ivy grew. The great church door flew open wide, and as they walked up the broad aisle, soft tones of music sounded from the organ. "'Our master first, said the gingerbread pair, making room for Knud and Joanna. As they knelt at the altar, Joanna bent her head over him, and cold, icy tears fell on his face from her eyes. They were indeed tears of ice, for her heart was melting towards him through his strong love, and as her tears fell on his burning cheeks, he awoke. He was still sitting under the willow tree in a strange land, on a cold winter evening, with snow and hail falling from the clouds and beating upon his face. "'That was the most delightful hour of my life,' said he, "'although it was only a dream. Oh, let me dream again!' Then he closed his eyes once more, and slept and dreamed. Towards morning there was a great fall of snow. The wind drifted it over him, but he still slept on. The villagers came forth to go to church. By the roadside they found a workman seated, but he was dead, frozen to death, under a willow tree. End of Under the Willow Tree Section 23 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Slough. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848. To 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Pea Blossom. There were once five peas in one shell. They were green, and the shell was green, and so they believed that the whole world must be green also, which was a very natural conclusion. The shell grew, and the peas grew. They accommodated themselves to their position and sat all in a row. The sun shone without, and warmed a shell, and a rain made it clear and transparent. It was mild and agreeable in broad daylight, and dark at night, as it generally is, and the peas as they sat there grew bigger and bigger, and more thoughtful as they mused, for they felt there must be something else for them to do. "'Are we to sit here forever?' asked one. "'Shall we not become hard by sitting so long?' It seems to me there must be something outside, and I feel sure of it. And as weeks passed by, the peas became yellow, and the shell became yellow. All the world is turning yellow, I suppose, said they, and perhaps they were right. Suddenly they felt a pull at the shell. It was torn off, and held in human hands, then slipped into the pocket of a jacket in company with other full pods. "'Now we shall soon be opened,' said one, just what they all wanted. "'I should like to know which of us will travel furthest,' said the smallest of the five. "'We shall soon see now.' "'What is to happen will happen,' said the largest pea. "'Crack!' went the shell, as it burst, and the five peas rolled out into the bright sunshine. There they lay in a child's hand. A little boy was holding them tightly and said they were fine peas for his pea-shooter, and immediately he put one in and shot it out. "'Now I am flying out into the wide world,' said he. "'Catch me if you can!' And he was gone in a moment. "'I,' said the second, "'intend to fly straight to the sun. That is a shell that lets itself be seen, and it will suit me exactly.' And away he went. "'We will go to sleep wherever we find ourselves,' said the two next. "'We shall still be rolling onwards.' And they did certainly fall on the floor, and roll about before they got into the pea-shooter. 
but they were put in for all that. "'We shall go farther than the others,' said they. "'What is to happen will happen,' exclaimed the last, as he was shot out of the pea-shooter, and as he spoke he flew up against an old board under a garret window, and fell into a little crevice, which was almost filled up with moss and soft earth. The moss closed itself round him, and there he lay, a captive indeed, but not unnoticed by God. "'What is to happen will happen,' said he to himself. Within the little garret lived a poor woman, who went out to clean stoves, chop wood into small pieces, and perform such like hard work, for she was strong and industrious. Yet she remained always poor, and at home in the garret lay her only daughter, not quite grown up, and very delicate and weak. For a whole year she had kept her bed, and it seemed as if she could neither live nor die. "'She is going to her little sister,' said the woman. "'I had but the two children, and it was not an easy thing to support both of them, but a good God helped me in my work, and took one of them to himself, and provided for her. Now I would gladly keep the other that was left to me, but I suppose they are not to be separated, and my sick girl will very soon go to her sister above. But the sick girl still remained where she was. Quietly and patiently she lay all the day long, while her mother was away from home at her work. Spring came, and one morning early the sun shone brightly through the little window, and threw its rays over the floor of the room, just as the mother was going to her work. The sick girl fixed her gaze on the lowest pane of the window. Mother, she exclaimed, what can that little green thing be that peeps in at the window? It is moving in the wind. The mother stepped to the window and half opened it. Oh, she said, there is actually a little pea which has taken root and is putting out its green leaves. How could it have got into this crack? Well now, here is a little garden for you to amuse yourself. So the bed of the sick girl was drawn nearer to the window, that she might see the budding plant, and the mother went out to her work. Mother, I believe I shall get well, said the sick child in the evening. The sun has shone in here so brightly and warmly today, and the little pea is thriving so well. I shall get on better, too, and go out into the warm sunshine again. God grant it, said the mother, but she did not believe it would be so. But she propped up with the little stick the green plant which had given her child such pleasant hopes of life, so that it might not be broken by the winds. She tied the piece of string to the window sill and to the upper part of the frame, so that the pea tendrils might twine round it when it shot up. And it did shoot up. Indeed, it might almost be seen to grow from day to day. Now really here is a flower coming, said the old woman one morning, and now at last she began to encourage the hope that her sick daughter might really recover. She remembered that for some time the child had spoken more cheerfully, and during the last few days had raised herself in bed in the morning to look with sparkling eyes at her little garden which contained only a single pea plant. A week after, the invalid sat up for the first time a whole hour, feeling quite happy by the open window in the warm sunshine, while outside grew the little plant, and on it a pink pea blossom in full bloom. The little maiden bent down and gently kissed the delicate leaves. This day was to her like a festival. Our heavenly father himself has planted that pea, and made it grow and flourish to bring joy to you, and hope to me, my blessed child said the happy mother, and she smiled at the flower, as if it had been an angel from God. But what became of the other peas? Why, the one who flew out into the wide world, and said, Catch me if you can, fell into a gutter on the roof of a house, and ended his troubles in the crop of a pigeon. The two lazy ones were carried quite as far, for they also were eaten by pigeons, so they were at least of some use. But the fourth, who wanted to reach the sun, fell into a sink, and lay there in the dirty water for days and weeks. 
till he had swelled to a great size. "'I am getting beautifully fat,' said the pea. "'I expect I shall burst at last. No pea could do more than that, I think. I am the most remarkable of all the five which were in the shell.' And the sink confirmed the opinion. But the young maiden stood at the open garret window with sparkling eyes, and a rosy hue of health on her cheeks. She folded her thin hands over the pea-blossom, and thanked God for what he had done. I, said the sink, shall stand up for my pea. End of the pea-blossom Recording by Alex Slough www.twitter.com slash alex of the day Section 24 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Alex Lau Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories Volume 3 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen translated by H P Paul she was good for nothing the mayor stood at the open window he looked smart for his shirt frill in which he had stuck a breast pin and his ruffles were very fine he had shaved his chin uncommonly smooth although he had cut himself slightly and had stuck a piece of newspaper over the place Hark ye, youngster, cried he. The boy to whom he spoke was no other than the son of a poor washerwoman who was just going past the house. He stopped and respectfully took off his cap. The peak of this cap was broken in the middle, so that he could easily roll it up and put it in his pocket. He stood before the mayor in his poor but clean and well-mended clothes, with heavy wooden shoes on his feet, looking as humble as if it had been the king himself. "'You are a good civil boy,' said the mayor. "'I suppose your mother is busy washing the clothes down by the river, "'and you are going to carry that thing to her that you have in your pocket. "'It is very bad for your mother. "'How much have you got in it?' "'Only half a quartern," stammered the boy in a frightened voice. "'And she has had just as much this morning already.' "'No, it was yesterday,' replied the boy. Two halves make a whole, said the mayor. She is good for nothing. What a sad thing it is with these people. Tell your mother she ought to be ashamed of herself. Don't you become a drunkard, but I expect you will, though. Poor child. There, go now. The boy went on his way with his cap in his hand, while the wind fluttered his golden hair till the locks stood up straight. He turned round a corner of the street into the little lane that led to the river, where his mother stood in the water by her washing bench, beating the linen with a heavy wooden bar. The floodgates at the mill had been drawn up, and as the water rolled rapidly on, the sheets were dragged along by the stream and nearly overturned the bench, so that the washerwoman was obliged to lean against it to keep it steady. I have been very nearly carried away she said it is a good thing that you are come for i want something to strengthen me it is cold in the water and i have stood here for six hours have you brought anything for me the boy drew the bottle from his pocket and the mother put it to her lips and drank a little ah how much good that does and how it warms me she said it is as good as a hot meal and not so dear drink a little my boy you look quite pale you are shivering in your thin clothes, and autumn has really come. Oh, how cold the water is! I hope I shall not be ill, but no, I must not be afraid of that. Give me a little more, and you may have a sip too, but only a sip. You must not get used to it, my poor dear child. She stepped up to the bridge on which the boy stood as she spoke, and came on shore. The water dripped from the straw mat which she had bound round her body and from her gown. "'I work hard and suffer pain with my poor hands,' said she. 
but I do it willingly, that I may be able to bring you up honestly and truthfully, my dear boy. At the same moment, a woman rather older than herself came towards them. She was a miserable-looking object, lame of one leg, and with a large false curl hanging down over one of her eyes, which was blind. This curl was intended to conceal the blind eye, but it made the defect only more visible. She was a friend of the laundress, and was called among the neighbours, Lame Martha with the curl. "'Oh, you poor thing! How you do work standing there in the water!' she exclaimed. "'You really do need something to give you a little warmth, and yet spiteful people cry out about the few drops you take.' And then Martha repeated to the laundress, in a very few minutes, all that the mayor had said to her boy, which she had overheard, and she felt very angry that any man could speak as he had done of a mother to her own child, about the few drops she had taken, and she was still more angry because on that very day the mayor was going to have a dinner party at which there would be wine, strong, rich wine, drunk by the bottle. Many will take more than they ought, but they don't call that drinking. They are all right. You are good for nothing indeed, cried Martha indignantly. And so he spoke to you in that way, did he, my child? said the washerwoman, as her lips trembled as she spoke. He says you have a mother who is good for nothing. Well, perhaps he is right, but he should not have said it to my child. How much has happened to me from that house? Yes, said Martha. I remember you were in service there, and lived in the house when the mayor's parents were alive. How many years ago that is! Bushels of salt have been eaten since then, and people may well be thirsty. And Martha smiled. The mayor's great dinner party today ought to have been put off, but the news came too late. The footman told me the dinner was already cooked, when a letter came to say that the mayor's younger brother in Copenhagen is dead. Dead? cried the laundress, turning pale as death. Yes, certainly, replied Martha. But why do you take it so much to heart? I suppose you knew him years ago, when you were in service there. Is he dead? she exclaimed. Oh, he was such a kind, good-hearted man. There are not many like him. And the tears rolled down her cheeks as she spoke. Then she cried. Oh, dear me, I feel quite ill. Everything is going round me. I cannot bear it. Is the bottle empty? and she leaned against a plank. "'Dear me, you are ill indeed,' said the other woman. "'Come, cheer up. Perhaps it will pass off. No, indeed, I see you are really ill. The best thing for me to do is to lead you home.' "'But my washing yonder. I will take care of that. Come, give me your arm. The boy can stay here and take care of the linen, and I'll come back and finish the washing. It is but a trifle.' The limbs of the laundress shook under her, and she said, I have stood too long in the cold water, and I have had nothing to eat the whole day since the morning. Oh, kind heaven, help me to get home. I am in a burning fever. Oh, my poor child. And she burst into tears, and he, poor boy, wept also, as he sat alone by the river, near to and watching the damp linen. The two women walked very slowly. The laundress slipped and tottered through the lane, and round the corner into the street where the mayor lived. And just as she reached the front of his house, she sank down upon the pavement. Many persons came round her, and lame Martha ran into the house for help. The mayor and his guests came to the window. "'Oh, it is the laundress,' said he. "'She has had a little drop too much. She is good for nothing.' It is a sad thing for her pretty little son. I like the boy very well, but the mother is good for nothing. After a while, the laundress recovered herself, and they led her to her poor dwelling, and put her to bed. Kind Martha warmed a mug of beer for her, with butter and sugar. She considered this to be the best medicine, and then hastened to the river, washed and rinsed, badly enough to be sure, but she did her best. 
Then she drew the linen ashore, wet as it was, and laid it in a basket. Before evening she was sitting in the poor little room with the laundress. The mayor's cook had given her some roasted potatoes, and a beautiful piece of fat for the sick woman. Martha and the boy enjoyed these good things very much, but the sick woman could only say that the smell was very nourishing, she thought. By and by the boy was put to bed, in the same bed as the one in which his mother lay, but he slept at her feet, covered with an old quilt made of blue and white patchwork. The laundress felt a little better by this time. The warm beer had strengthened her, and the smell of the good food had been pleasant to her. "'Many thanks, you good soul,' she said to Martha. "'Now the boy is asleep. I will tell you all. He is soon asleep. How gentle and sweet he looks as he lies there with his eyes closed. He does not know how his mother has suffered, and heaven grant he never may know it. I was in service at the councillors, the father of the mayor, and it happened that the youngest of his sons, the student, came home. I was a young wild girl then, but honest, that I can declare in the sight of heaven. The student was merry and gay, brave and affectionate. Every drop of blood in him was good and honourable. A better man never lived on earth. He was the son of the house, and I was only a maid. But he loved me truly and honourably, and he told his mother of it. She was to him as an angel upon earth. She was so wise and loving. He went to travel, and before he started, he placed a gold ring on my finger. And as soon as he was out of the house, my mistress sent for me. Gently and earnestly she drew me to her, and spake as if an angel were speaking. She showed me clearly in spirit and in truth the difference there was between him and me. He is pleased now, she said, with your pretty face, but good lucks do not last long. You have not been educated like he has, you are not equals in mind and rank, and therein lies the misfortune. I esteem the poor, she added. In the sight of God they may occupy a higher place than many of the rich, but here upon earth, we must beware of entering upon a false track, lest we are overturned in our plans, like a carriage that travels by a dangerous road. I know a worthy man, an artisan, who wishes to marry you. I mean Eric, the glove-maker. He is a widower without children, and in a good position. Will you think it over? Every word she said pierced my heart like a knife, but I knew she was right and the thought pressed heavily upon me. I kissed her hand and wept bitter tears, and I wept still more when I went to my room, and threw myself on the bed. I passed through a dreadful night. God knows what I suffered, and how I struggled. The following Sunday I went to the house of God, to pray for light to direct my path. It seemed like a providence, that as I stepped out of church, Eric came towards me, and then there remained not a doubt in my mind. We were suited to each other in rank and circumstances. He was even then a man of good means. I went up to him and took his hand and said, Do you still feel the same for me? Yes, ever and always, said he. Will you then marry a maiden who honours and esteems you, although she cannot offer you her love? But that may come. Yes, it will come said he, and we joined our hands together, and I went to my mistress, the gold ring which her son had given me, I wore next to my heart. I could not place it on my finger during the daytime, but only in the evening, when I went to bed, I kissed the ring till my lips almost bled, and then I gave it to my mistress, and told her that the bands were to be put up for me, and the glove-maker the following week. Then my mistress threw her arms round me, and kissed me. She did not say that I was good for nothing. Very likely I was better then than I am now, but the misfortunes of this world were unknown to me then. At Michaelmas we were married, and for the first year everything went well with us. We had a journeyman, 
and an apprentice, and you are our servant, Martha. Ah, yes, and you are a dear, good mistress, said Martha. I shall never forget how kind you and your husband were to me. Yes, those were happy years when you were with us. Although we had no children at first, the student I never met again. Yet I saw him once, although he did not see me. He came to his mother's funeral. I saw him looking pale as death, and deeply troubled, standing at her grave, for she was his mother. Some time after, when his father died, he was in foreign lands, and did not come home. I know that he never married. I believe he became a lawyer. He had forgotten me, and even had we met, he would not have known me, for I have lost all my good looks, and perhaps that is all for the best. And then she spoke of the dark days of trial, when misfortune had fallen upon them. We had five hundred dollars, she said, and there was a house in the street to be sold for two hundred, so we thought it would be worth our while to pull it down and build a new one in its place. So it was bought. The builder and carpenter made an estimate that the new house would cost ten hundred and twenty dollars to build. Eric had credit, so he borrowed the money in the chief town, but the captain who was bringing it to him was shipwrecked, and the money was lost. Just about this time, my dear sweet boy, who lies sleeping there, was born, and my husband was attacked with a severe lingering illness. For three quarters of a year I was obliged to dress and undress him. We were backward in our payments, we borrowed more money, and all that we had was lost and sold. And then my husband died. Since then I have worked, toiled, and striven for the sake of the child. I have scrubbed and washed both coarse and fine linen, but I have not been able to make myself better off. And it was God's will, in his own time, he will take me to himself. But I know he will never forsake my boy. In the morning she felt much refreshed and strong enough, as she thought, to go on with her work. But as soon as she stepped into the cold water, a sudden faintness seized her. She clutched at the air convulsively with her hand, took one step forward, and fell. Her head rested on dry land, but her feet were in the water. Her wooden shoes, which were only tied on by a wisp of straw, were carried away by the stream, and thus she was found by Martha when she came to bring her some coffee. In the meantime a messenger had been sent to her house by the mayor, to say that she must come to him immediately, as he had something to tell her. It was too late. A surgeon had been sent for to open a vein in her arm, but the poor woman was dead. She has drunk herself to death, said the cruel mayor. In the letter containing the news of his brother's death, it was stated that he had left in his will a legacy of six hundred dollars to the glove-maker's widow, who had been his mother's maid, to be paid with discretion in large or small sums to the widow or her child. There was something between my brother and her, I remember, said the mayor. It is a good thing that she is out of the way, for now the boy will have the whole. I will place him with honest people to bring him up, that he may become a respectable working man. And the blessing of God rested upon these words. The mayor sent for the boy to come to him, and promised to take care of him, but most cruelly added that it was a good thing that his mother was dead, for she was good for nothing. They carried her to the churchyard, the churchyard in which the poor were buried. Martha strewed sand on the grave, and planted a rose tree upon it, and the boy stood by her side. Oh, my poor mother, he cried, while the tears rolled down his cheeks. Is it true what they say, that she was good for nothing? No, indeed it is not true, replied the old servant, raising her eyes to heaven. She was worth a great deal. I knew it years ago, and since the last night of her life, I am more certain of it than ever. 
I say she was a good and worthy woman, and God, who is in heaven, knows I am speaking the truth, though the world may say, even now, she was good for nothing. End of She Was Good For Nothing Reading by Alex Lau www.twitter.com slash alex of the day End of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories Volume 3 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen Translated by H. P. Paul